so we, one moment, we will now begin our, our fourth session, session of today. Um, and what will be, is it possible to get some more of this? It's over this, my favorite, favorite molecules. Um, the, this fourth session will be focusing uh, on hopefully offering a bit more granular detail into the, this proposition or conjecture about the geotechnology that looks like a geopolitics, geopolitics that looks like a, a geotechnology, and to elucidate some of the discussions around um, the forms of the political in which we are more sort of more used to uh, in relation to this that we talked a fair bit about yesterday as well. Um, and so um, again, just to sort of uh, get our traction uh, in this, this question of how it is that um, the, the, the re-decision around the construction of the geotechnology uh, might uh, might take place in this at least allowance not a prediction but an allowance for the notion that the not just that the emergency is something that is declared by the sovereign but that that sovereign decision may be something that in an essence emerges from the um, it emerges from the emergency and that quite importantly that the what we might say that the geobiopolitics that might ensue from this would have as its object of of interest and in, in governance uh, not the indexing and amplification of um, the general will, um, as you say, not not another open mic night forum by which all conceptive beliefs are, are spoken into the public record and thus fused <coughs> into some temporary consensus but rather something that is more directly interested in um, those, that planetary geochemistry itself uh, as the object of, the, of, 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 the, of, of this as well. And so it's not that we are some way uh, against or uh, to remove the whole notion of vox populi, popular voice, but rather that um, there may in fact need to be something else allowed for uh, allowed for as well. Um, and so in a certain sense, given the fact that it, as we've discussed that in many respects the technical means, financial means, logistical means for the structural transformations that we're speaking about that are nevertheless uh, infinitely, seemingly infinitely um, deferred, that that uh, New Leviathan, as we might sort of say, or that sort of position it may less be something that's sort of issuing totally alien commands um, and something completely unexpected, or rather, there's something that's simply capable of enforcing existing expertise um, that we that we already have. But even this, in doing so, may may uh, it's, again, this is not sort of like suggesting that this is necessarily the, the like the the preference, but may uh, uh, arise from and also be uh, based on this shift or inversion of the normal chain of representation by which representation becomes policy, uh, and the word becomes the word becomes made so. Um, and in this sense, there may be another way against that the the dynamic of base determining superstructure. Uh, becomes uh, it, it re returns in a in a different in a, in, a diff in a different kind of in a different kind of way. So um, again, to sort of go back to the previous point that we were going back around it in terms of the identification of the points of the by which the political en enters into this. The, the the interest here is not to somehow transcend politics or to find the perfect machine by which decisions never need to be made again. Uh, that the, in this sense, this is, this is not at all really sort of the interest, but rather in a way to call its bluff. Um, 
uh, that the, the assignments around the need for the transformation of planetary biochemistry, of course, not really, not only listed, limited to greenhouse uh, gr greenhouse uh, gases and all this is the other kinds of things as well, but but once again to um, problematize or to put into some or at least into sort of serious suspicion the idea that <clears throat> the way in which that we would arrive at the capacity for the proper composition of this artificial viable planetary would first begin uh, in a way sort of by us finally being the change we want to see in the world or something that and there's some kind of it, it might sort of go like a moral or ethical shift in us that, that and that, that and generates a sort of larger cultural shift um, in this way that that cultural shift which may be very important may be as much the effect um, as the cause or as we say it's its base may precede superstructure but in fact it's base all the way down so what we've been what we I, I spoke a little bit about yesterday um, in speaking of this notion of what we call what a lack of a better shorthand came to call the avatar model of political representation um, uh, is in one in which this indexing and, and organization of general will um, is then run through a, a kind of cask a, a trophic cascade of a of a sort which is the uh, the political institutional structure, but it's one that is a binding script of not just certain, not just some kinds of political systems, but in fact, most of the political systems that we've derived in one way, including parliaments and monarchies and central central command economies, um, uh, as well. All of which are have some basis of a kind of symbolic, uh, a sort of supply chain of symbols. Um, as the basis of their organization, as as something, the notion of a transitive interest is articulated into this kind of wish fulfillment, and so this chain of symbolization, the supply chain of symbols, within would go something like this. So, first, there is identification of some kind of bad thing that we would, make, you know, off lots of other starting points, but some sort of bad thing that does the bad things. We want to we then imagine the inverse is bad thing that is now the good thing. We want to make the good thing happen. And it's a sort of force. So first, there is this a personal or cultural identification with the good thing. We are the people. We are the good people who believe the good thing. We want the good thing. Therefore, we are the good people. Next, we find particular humans, particular other people who avatars will call them, who are in a way embody embody this good thing. Embody the the thing that we want to to have happen. They are uniquely possessed. Of this, of this, of this intention, they personify it quite literally and personify its its particular articulation. We then hone and carve and choose between and, and interrogate and prosecute these possible avatars to figure out who really is the true representative and true embodiment of this of this of this intention. Um, spend a lot of time doing it, and then apparently the phones don't work, so we can't. Actually, call in the results, but honing and defining these avatars and testing them for their exact personification, grilling them for potential errors in this personification. Collectively, then we invest the, a, a plurality of these avatars with a official agency to articulate through their various personifications within some special sovereign forum um, the 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 expression uh, by which these potential policies are represented and debated and, 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 and um, uh, represented, performed. There, this gathering of avatars will contest all of the potential symbolizations. And then, if we're lucky, uh, we'll codify some consensus declaration into a decree, a law, words written down that say what, what must be in order for the good to be so. These are text-based model simulations of the future transformations that would seek to ensure that the good is realized. And then, after all of this mishigash, the financial means are allocated to actually realize this, de this decree simulation in the world. 
Those technical means are then, finally, some sort of technical process is, is set in motion, which would, in principle, deploy those means and the ends and, and ends that are, one hopes, in direct correspondence with the qualities of those previous avatars' performance of their original identification with the good. This employment of the technical means hopefully will defeat the bad things that originally we were concerned about to suffer. And if this process does not work, if this supply chains of this, this, this uh, trophic cascade of symbolization does not work, then we, uh, and there is not less of the bad thing, then we return to the point and the phase in which those avatars are properly honed and filtered for the purity of their personification of the good. We must have, there must be the wrong person in the chair. Uh, and they must, in fact, not be, they, in fact, must be um, personified of something that is not what we intended. Repeat. So this is my characterization of this, of this sequence. There's various versions of this that are ancient. And also, it says without, we can say without qualification that this process, in many ways, is responsible for many of the most difficult and treasured accomplishments of what is called um, the political. So it's not to summarily dismiss this, but rather to, in a way, try to understand it's the conditionality and perhaps arbitrariness by which we might come to conclude that this is the only way in which anything really ever happens. There is, which it's not, and there is beyond this, um, with sort of in the center of this whole, in, in the center of this sort of principle, as I've suggested in a few different ways, uh, a kind of uh, uh, explicit or implicit presumption that, that the there is a precedent of the symbolic and denotative before the before the technical. Whatever it is, that, whatever means are deployed on behalf of this public to cause the change that happened, that those means themselves are actually a representation of the linguistic articulation of the thing that they're supposed to do. If you want the machine to do something, the way to do it is to write down in words a description of the thing that you want it to have happen. And therefore, this correspondence is how it is that you work this as well. This can work quite well. This isn't an argument this as well. But the presumption that by necessity, the symbolic precedes the technical in this in the supply chain is, in fact, more arbitrary than it may appear, um, such that this, this economy of recursive identification and the intensification of identification with this ideals through the medium of the political itself as a kind of performative, a, a process and forum of performative symbolization in ways can, in ways that are, I think, quite obvious, actually unlink the ideation from the effect. That is, because there is such an intense preoccupation with the proper, not only with the proper symbolization of the thing that we want to have happen, but with the proper intensification of the, 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 the personification of he or she or it who is supposed to do that symbolization that would then eventuate in the outcome, that because of the intensity of, of, of of interest in that personification simulation. This actually allows for a delinking of that personification, the ideation, from the outcome that we want. It actually prevents it from working because there's so much attention on the, pers on the personification rather than the other. Sometimes it animates occasional <coughs> and irregular rallies, as we see here. It's a sort of, sort of um, extreme example, I think, of the of the in the some years ago of the wave of chromatic uh, sort of chromo politics um, by which the people who are identify with orange versus the people who identify with blue um, split Ukraine uh, <clears throat> down the middle. Now, what or the people who wear yellow are may become a lot of trouble for. Macron or black became trouble for in Seattle. Um, that the, it's in fact in a way that the orange can mean whatever you want it to mean. The blue can mean whatever you want it to mean that it actually has, it, it, that it can work. 
these, this chromopolitics, and I'm, again, I'm sort of suggesting this as a kind of um, extreme example of some of the uh, fragilities of this, of, the, of what happens when the this economy of symbolization and personification um, becomes so self-referential. They gain energy because they signify everything, that all manner of, 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 of aspiration and complaint can be contained within them. And they dissipate so quickly because, because they mean everything, they actually therefore mean nothing. Along the way, they may absorb and then amplify and broadcast all forms of legitimate and real hope and pain, joy, anger, become invested in these arbitrary signifiers that are meant to, in some way, absorb and intensify this interest that sort of the will that somehow, some way down the line would be translated into a, a, a symbolic specification that some way would be translated into allocation of financial means, that some way would be allocated into an actual transformation in the world that would alleviate the, this, this, initial state of, this initial state of things. But, and yet, because in fact it is a kind of, of um, uh, an a investment of intention in the symbol itself, it has, this, it has these outcomes. Meanwhile, in the meantime, the planetary biochemistry that we're concerned with uh, remains uh, unimpressed uh, and unmoved. Now, uh, in ways in which we have sort of talked about why this matters um, is because there, in, in ways that uh, we want to be very clear about, um, a lot of the ways in which the, the, the current response to the climatic uh, crisis that we find ourselves in is probably too beholden to this, um, to the av avatar cycle. Uh, and, it, and because it is, it is not as effective as it probably could be um, or should be, and that it risks the same kind of collapse into increasingly desperate forms of shadow play. The more, and, and this matters, the more it fails, the more it simply absorbs anger and hope and joy and worry and action and sort of sense of responsibility into empty placebo signifiers, the worse things get. The more the persistent delay in strong actual action regarding the actual geoeconomics of climate, geoeconomics of automation, so forth, uh, the worse things get, the more it becomes different, and more likely then as I say, more likely as this sort of continues to fail, that it becomes, in essence, more likely that whatever, quote, governance is in the years to come, um, as it tries to deal with populations exposed to the most, uh, the riskiest and most dangerous effects of this transformation, planetary biochemistry, the more likely that whatever that governance is and becomes will amount to something quite cruel and stupid um, and inequitable and reactionary. The fact that this fails matters. So planning can also, to be absolutely sort of clear, planning can fail catastrophically, um, as our pleasant demonstration it indicates. It's not, it's not a kind of simple turn of the knob from one direction to the other and we're all good. Um, and it's also not, <clears throat> as I say, that we're not operating under planned ecologies and planned economics. We, in fact, are. But in a way, we're doing so in bad faith. Like, there are lots of plans in which we are in, 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 in embedded and entrenched within, but because we wish to not see them as plans, wish to not see them in this way, um, we're both having convinced ourselves that there's some other more abstract process at work, the invisible hand of the market, um, something, this something called capital, which is the basis of capitalism, also a concept that can sometimes mean everything and nothing at the same time, and absorb all the anger, 
uh, into itself, destiny, strategy, conspiracy, whatever, to not see these plans actually makes it much harder to, uh, to uh, find them and deal with them in this way. And so, um, if so, then the collapses that we're looking at, that the both forms of failure that we're sort of looking at, um, can will you know could collapse in a lot of different, in a number of different ways. Um, do the normal national jurisdictions expand? Do they collapse? Um, what happens to them? Regardless, um, the visionary child who stands before the congregation and proclaims the sins of the elders may represent um, for them all, may represent to those, all of the, the young who have no choice but to live unthinkable lives. Um, the problem is that the actual future is deaf to these kinds of um, forms of penitence and salvation. So something else is, is needed if we actually want to actually change the actual circumstance. If we're content with the drama of it all, if the performativity of it all is, is sufficient, then you're in good shape. Now, the question of planning and this notion of this, well, obviously, to, to speak directly to this, um, no simple thing, no, nothing that sort of suggests that it's um, uh, you know, any kind of solution itself. And of course, it means different things in different contexts. In, in China, as we've been discussing, for example, the relationship to central planning is quite different than it is in California, for example. Uh, in Russia, uh, as we all know, the kind of nervous exhaustion, the very idea of the five-year plan, 10-year plan, whatever, is, is, is sort of pervasive, a, a, a well-earned cynicism at the very idea. Um, but regardless of whether the, the resistance to planning takes the shape of something like a conservative individualism, like we don't need this, we just need the invisible hand of the market, historical memory, legal corporatism, simple ignorance, frustration, whatever, all, of, all fine um, as they go. Um, none, of these act, none of these sort of reflect, reflexes um, really matter as much in the broad scheme of things as the damage that has been brought and will continue to be brought um, to the operation of our inevitably artificial planetarity without a plan. That's the worst of the scenario. That's the worst of the situation. It may be that a, um, a bad plan is actually better than no plan at all. Meanwhile, in certain ways, what is called the, just it, it, to speak of this, what is called the left, more generally, is, is also at the same time, re, it simultaneously, I think, in, in relationship to these issues of an the, the, the Con sometimes confounding issues in relation to ecological politics is reconfronting the fact potentially that in some cases and in some ways that are quite decisive, its traditional base um, may be among the least reliable of constituencies for the elective incorporation of carbon restrictive economies, e economics, for reasons both good and bad. Or who knows, maybe those constituent bases still will remain some kind of multitudinous vanguard uh, at the end and, and, and will end up saving the day, deus ex machina, uh, at the final hour. Um, but again, instead of only looking at how political change might authorize subsequent shifts in climate policy, we also have to once more focus on the inverse. How abrupt climate force changes in human geography and political geography may in turn change the fundamental architectures of institutional governance itself. It's not just how, the, the, how it is, that the, what can we do with the political architectures that may transform what that ecological structure is. It may very much work the, work the other way around. Um, and these kinds of shifts can come from sometimes unexpected places and from people and places and things that under other circumstances will be thought to have no agency, their circumstance itself sometimes ends up having quite a bit 
for example, instead of casting climate refugees as some kind of, as I say, substitute political class whose, sacri you know, whose sacrifice allows wealthy biennial goers to bear witness while the growing wave of people occupying new lands does something else. It, it pushes, in fact, the legitimacy of, quote, citizenship past its breaking point. This is a big deal. Who and what is a citizen, what is guaranteed by citizenship at a certain point becomes overwhelmed by its exceptions that it is no longer the rule. That's a big deal. <clears throat> now, if you're still with me, I now want, I'd like to say a few words on behalf of surveillance. <laughs> Maybe I'll lose some more people now. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in order to govern, uh, <clears throat> in order to make good on this idea of governing geobiopolitical flows directly, um, whatever that emergent geopolitics is, whether it looks like what we have or it looks like something different than what we have, whether it's however, wherever it is, <clears throat> would need good and sufficient information about what it is that it governs. What is in fact, what are those flows? What in fact is happening there? As so as to identify the broad outlines and, and effects of any of these kinds of plans. Now, as we've discussed in a number of ways already, the liberal model that we have inherited in both its left and political left and right versions presumes reflexively that this information about what the governance needs in order to do its job presumes reflexively that what that means is obviously, duh, data about individual people individuated it people and individuated people and the governance of those individuated people as individuated people thereof, including the, the uh, absorption and echoing of whatever their voice and ideas are. But it does not necessarily mean that. Um, now, as we've been talking about this, this geopolitical shift in relationship to the shift of geotechnology, geotechnology, we've talked about it. It's been suggested in a number of ways that some of the things that we have identified as that accidental megastructure of the stack, which may, in fact, is, is suggested become something that's a bit more artificial and deliberate in, 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 this case, in, in this case as well. This means that whatever that geopolitics that is a geogovernance and vice versa and things as well, that the question of algorithmic governance becomes an inevitable uh, circumstance in which we have to sort of uh, we have to account for in one way, in one ways as well. Um, and here, in a sense, is where this the rubber meets this road. Many of the, as we've been talking about, many of the uh, the, the deploy this question of what do we do with planetary scale computation and the identific or dissatisfied identification that we've made about its misuse as something that is deployed for the, the, this modeling of the indiv individuated profile. Many of the available, most popular, legible critiques of algorithmic governance, both populist and academic, I argue, replicate and reinforce the presumption that the most relevant data is about individuals but have a different idea about what the relative responsibilities of that individual and the mechanism that, that is sensing it may be. But the individual, as the core unit of analysis here, is not, is in fact, uh, again, I say replicated and reinforced. Um, the outcome of this is that uh, not just that we are doing bad things with planetary scale computation, but more importantly, that all of the time and energy and space that this deployment of the apparatus takes up is preventing the good things that we should be doing with planetary scale computation from having the space to grow and be able to do. It's not only that it's the bad things, it's preventing the good, the preventing the good things, which would be this geopolitical and technical emergence that we're talking about. 
Clear? Now, on this question of those stacks, as we, we were talking about yesterday, um, <coughs> It's not the same stack everywhere you go. Right? The stack is, is, is a kind of generic model for how it is that this might be organized. But there is, ha we have seen increasingly, a kind of forking speciation of stacks that are not only, that don't, aren't just contained by a particular geopolitical hemisphere. They are a particular geopolitical hemisphere. It's not just that the sphere of influence of China uses the China stack in order to enforce it. It is, the China stack is the sphere of influence of the China stack. And the same thing for the GAFA stack, the, 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 what will, our sort of shorthand for the North Atlantic, uh, the North Atlantic stack, which is not, and none of these, I mean, they are geographically delimited in some cases, but they're not, but they're in most cases not contiguous. The GAFA stack might be what we refer to have, it, it's sort of, Sphere of hemispherical sphere would include North America, much of South America, but also UK, but not so much Europe, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, spread all over the place. You know? China stack includes much of Africa. Um, but again, it's not just that there's this geopolitical structure that is using this technology. This technology has, in fact, has become the geopolitical structure around, around this as well. This is, of course, both the, um, as, a, as a certain kind of good news, bad news. Um, aspect to this as well, and it is 100%. There's, you don't. We, the argument does not. I do, I'm. You're knocking on an open door with me. Um, to argue that it's a very serious problem, um, that the vector of this this condition is one in which the largest holders of the relevant data include shareholder beholden advertising platforms and or authoritarian states and various combinations of those of those two. Again, it is entirely because of all these, let's say the, the misuses of this apparatus and not only it's also preventing some of the things that we would that we that we um, uh, that we would, uh, would would want to would want to sort of employ. Now um, by example um, in many so-called democracies, these platforms have become advertising companies, um, that, and which, has, as we were talking about recently, has had a, a strange kind of uh, be, the behavioral economics by which the incentive structures for the platform evolve in certain directions around the amplification of, of short-term attention spans uh, has ha is, is worked in this sort of, in this sort of way. Um, in, in other places where the platforms operate according to other kinds of relationships with the state, this is not, not necessarily um, this is not necessarily the case. The point I wish to sort of introduce at this point as well. Um, this is, by the way, if you you haven't if you don't have a, lo a whole lot of official CCP party apps on your phone, you're really missing out uh, on, on trying to understand what the um, uh, what's mobile media is really all about. The fact that, in sort of way, it, is, is that in terms of our current discussion, these, the, de, the very different kinds of debates about how much of this should be in the public realm uh, and how much of this should be in the private realm and what those concepts even mean in different ways is, is it, to me, evidentiary of the poverty of our imagination uh, that these become the only sort of terms by which the, the possible institutional forms that we can conceptualize. First, however, that these are even, these mean such different things in different kinds of cases. So in, in, one, in, 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 in one context, in many cases, most of the data that is generated through the platforms is owned and controlled and modeled by large private, large private entities. Uh, in such a case that should this information that is produced by these large private entities leak and get in the hands of the, the state, this is considered a, 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 a serious breach. Right? And you, some of you who ran into Ed Snowden at the restaurant last night, um, I'm sure talked to him about this problem. In other contexts, it's actually the inverse that's true. That the presumption is that the data that is generated is 
really is properly the is properly the exclu under, should be is and should be under the exclusive control of a public governance system, the state, and when it leaks from that and being is sort of is is used by by uh, private companies that this this leak is seriously problematic. And so part of the ways in which, for example, in Europe, EU has its own kind of increasingly insular stack model, the, in many ways, its approach is structured very much around the construction of this figure of, of, this figure of both publicly uh, empowered but also publicly accountable. In, there's a subject called the citizen, the number of sort of ways in which the question of data, the citizens will take back their data citizen-centered data, take back their data, presumably from private, private companies. And this data really is properly to be administered by the citizens, the, the proper representatives of those citizens, namely um, the national governments or transnational EU corporations. But that is the, the state, is, this is public. I mean, what, what public means is state. If you're not a citizen and in Europe, well, that's a different story. And so the question, at a moment in which the status of citizenship per se, who's in Europe, who's not in Europe, who's in Europe but not a citizen, who's not in Europe but is a citizen, is such a um, fraught question. But to reorganize this system around this, the predicate of the citizen is a stranger solution than it might, than it might, than it might first seem, uh, it might first appear. But it's also one whose solutions may be extremely uh, decisive. It may be that in, in many regards, the f that if you're operating to a certain extent, it, that the stack in which you spend most of your time is one in which you are um, you're operating inside the structural dictates of the citizen user as defined by this structure, as opposed to the structure of the user defined by other forms of stack. That may be more decisive than many of the other um, uh, uh, supposedly more fundamental political and economic agreements that conjured Europe as a common economy in the first place. It's also a weird question of like what is and isn't European data, but we'll, we'll sort of get this thing. All, and then sort of lastly, then, you know, as, as clear as we, you know, as you see from the sort of the China example, the presumption is that the data is, is obviously the, that the most fundamental data is obviously the, the purview of the state in many cases, the, the really the core profiles of, of users that even the large platforms to access um, are in essence um, accessed from um, gover from government uh, from sort of government sort of sources um, and and vice versa it's sort of a, a, a sort of complex arrangement but nevertheless you, the idea that the which counts as the public and private in this scenario is is not so is obviously not so clear. Um, Oh, I want to just sort of say on, on this idea of the sort of use. There was a I was trying to track it down last night, and I'm trying to find the links of this this well. But there was a fellow um, in the European Parliament um, who this, this was who had proposed the idea was sort of immediately shot down. But at, at a moment a few years ago, as GDPR was getting its sort of momentum, and there was a sort of maximum um, fervor over the organization and delineation of a true European internet sovereignty, and here's a term that means such different things in different locations, was to, and to um, kick out these, these this sort of alien, uh, uh, alien influences um, with a proposition to make a 100% European phone. Liter not just that it would be made by German and French or Luxembourgian companies, but the, all of the minerals like the actual sourcing of all of the processes, all the metal, all the minerals, all the glass, all the other thing would be made entirely out of, from European sources. So that's how you can have true control over the thing that gets made, that you're not dependent upon these external sort of things. And I, you know, very quickly, people raised their hand and said, Europe's just physically not made out of the things that go into phones. And so you can dig all you like. Um, you're not going to find sort of enough there. But, you get the idea. Now, here in Russia, this term internet sovereignty is a, ter is a term that is sort of increasingly used and has to do, you know, means a few different, a few different things, but namely that 
um, the national contiguous border um, of Russia, wherever that is decided to be, depending on whose map you're looking at, um, would have the, that the internet that is within inside the space would at least have the ability to fu fully function independent of whatever is going on outside this, outside this line. This is very difficult to do because of the way the internet is structured. It's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a rhetorical gesture as much as it is a sort of technical kind of politics. It's a way of probably of introducing other ways of controlling uh, information flows uh, within, within this. It's a way in which we have a kind of Russification of the Chinese model of a state structured internet. Internet sovereignty means something rather totally different to Europe. It doesn't mean the, it doesn't mean uh, uh, the governing government doing deep packet inspection. Uh, there's the, the notion of the citizen as this sort of site of sovereign usage of the system uh, would preclude this as well. And in the US, uh, it basically means you can post anything you want on 4chan and uh, nobody can tell you not to. Very different ideas around this sort of same term. OK, now back to our point. While it's certain, 100%, that the privacy of individual persons can and does enable many of the, mo of the most important forms of social systems that we've come to depend on from the beginnings of the most fundamental, you know, basic forms of society. Privacy is a, not only a good thing, it's, there's no such thing as society without various forms of, of, of privacy. Um, uh, and it's quite obviously true that in privacy, whatever this means, has real and non-negotiable benefits for everyone. It's like not only is it sort of individually good, but the systems upon which we all depend, depend for their workings on the capacity that certain parts of those systems are opaque to other parts of the system. That's, it, it is absolutely, it's actually sort of needed. But just as this connotation of the public versus private in the realm, the question of what we mean by the privacy versus publicity itself is a bit fraught. And frankly, the fact that in, in the cases that the battle over what, how those things would work is being fought in many cases over the question of individual privacy uh, is exactly the problem. So it is the, mo the individual human, to restate it, should not be the center cannot be the center of whatever the geoeconomic or geotechnical system that we wish to make. The Copernican turn is required here as well. The mechanisms of algorithmic governments need to be far less anthropocentric, far less mobilized around the individual wishes and wants and less fixated on the management of human culture thereby. Quite simply, when you try to m even model, let alone compose and set in motion some sort of complex social system in which each individual actor within this as well is structured as if it had sort of this uh, 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 literal perceptual autonomy in relationship to everything else. Um, it doesn't work well. So now, given this, given the essential ridiculousness of trying to model as complex social systems, as a, as, as a social system, as essentially just a lot of individual actors, work, private individual actors collaborating and working together in some sort of way. Um, so too, as I argue, the critiques of algorithmic governance that we are, so we've come to be, uh, and what is colloquially called surveillance capitalism, um, also uh, uh, don't get us as far as they should. Uh, in, 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 in finding a, an alternative to this. Um, in addition to the problem of improperly designed role for the individual humans, um, the deeper problem looms insofar that this has, be, again, this has become a design problem at all. Um, and unfortunately, there's more of a doubling and tripping, tripling down. Some exposés of surveillance capitalism that will go unnamed uh, provide Obviously, interesting, you know, very interesting outlines of how it, how it is that this the 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 financialization of the individual profiles has produ produces these opaque prediction markets um, that seek 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 to lock users into these kinds of funhouse um, funhouse worlds um, of our own of of our own reflection desire um, that makes all of those 
individual players susceptible to all forms of manipulation and real-time policing. And again, it is without a doubt deeply sad that this is what, of all the things that we could do with planetary scale computation, that that's in fact what we've, what we've chosen to do. At the same time, it's impossible for me to sort of approach sort of books, some of these sorts of approaches, um, some of whom written by Harvard Law School professors, as being, um, it's hard for me not to see as being it, it was sort of both concerned that the technology is being used in this way and that this is the wrong way to use it, but also on a deeper level, the concern or the scandal is that computational platforms are actually organizing society in ways that, from this, their perspective, formal, legal, political forums imagine themselves to have the exclusive right to do so. The problem is not just that technology is being used this way, but that te technology is organized society in ways that the law should be organizing society in this way. There's a technical sovereignty at work here that is superseding a legal sovereignty, and that's the real thing we must put a stop to. That is, it's impossible for me to sort of read these um, without feeling like, yeah, that's exactly what you'd expect a Harvard Law School professor to say. Of course, from their perspective, the, as the sort of de, as de jure legal sovereignty loses ground to de facto platform technical sovereignty, the law loses ground to technology. The words lose ground to numbers. And would we not expect that particular establishment to mobilize around the formal, liberal, legal, individual as the, as, and the sanctity of the uh, explicit contract as the basis of this, as the basis of, the, of, of the scandal. They say, perhaps, God damn it, the lawyers are supposed to compose sovereignty, not the infrastructure itself. It's supposed to merely reflect the original symbolization and signification that w we have allowed for it to, to authorize. This is exactly what we would expect the cultural center of Atlantic legal discourse would offer as its house policy. It is an establishment theory of over-individualized data that is, in fact, in direct concert in many cases with some of the populist outcries around it. So instead of, and instead of steering this mechanism away from individuation, which is not what it's interested in doing, it, it would, which towards something else it should be doing instead, it, in fact, actively and explicitly reinforces the core logic that it purports to criticize. Other things to be said about the, the kind of counter-weaponization of, of surveillance on an individual level as well, but we'll leave that part at that point. Now, back to my pro-surveillance riffs. Now, away from Harvard, also in various critical art and design circles, the theme of surveillance is now, in some respects, a, a, an almost now sort of a, is canonical. The surveillance art and counter surveillance design is like it has its own genres and subgenres. It's 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 it is a it's a a position that you can sort of hold. And most of these sort of works um, are, as you're probably over aware, uh, revolve around certain attempts to unmask. Uh, unsettle, overthrow, or defeat surveillance technologies in all their guises, on their own, you know, on their own terms, in, in, as a kind of counter weaponization of the individual in relationship to this in, 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 in environment. In doing so, part of the genre, um, sort of part of the claim, is, is also to um, dis define a great many, almost as many as possible, to find a great many number of technologies who's, who incl that include the function of sensing and sensing the world and ordering information about the world as being essentially tools of surveillance. That surveillance becomes the master concept by which machinic censoring and information ordering is understood not just specifically but generally. And and therefore, all of these things 
are to be, or potentially opposed, resisted as forms of surveillance because they are forms of surveillance. And as everyone knows, surveillance is bad. Some, much of this work is actually, I think, quite brilliant. Um, some of it is less so. Um, the latter, as I say, may be inspired more from sort of cursory, quick readings of Foucault via WikiLeaks. Um, and and, and ten, have a tendency to include any platform based on artificial sensors, that sort of sensing organization of the world, are included within this sort of narrative about panopticons, Foucault and policing, and all part of this Oedipal overwatch that needs to be, uh, needs to be expanded. It's an inflation and expansion of the concept of surveillance uh, beyond its actual usefulness. I recall a lecture, here's proof, um, by a colleague who was doing a talk on smart cities that included, as at the beginning, this amazing slide with two adjacent images that were meant to, quite as she explained it, demonstrate a, a clear equivalence in how techno-scientific capitalism disciplines bodies with surveillance. A UPC barcode next to a diagram of a, of the, a, tra of a transatlantic slave trade ship. Now, where to start? These kinds of <laughs> these kinds of flattening analogies draw of which we we'll probably all have can pick find out we could probably volunteer our own examples. Draw inference based on superficial visual similarity, flimsy correlation, circular reasoning, and no doubt grievously ahistorical thinking. Um, but this is where we find ourselves. This example is sort of grotesque, is sort of extreme. However, and this is, that's, is, this is really the main point, and this has to do with this problem of the over-individuation and, and the, uh, our inability to think around the, prob the individuation as a, as a given. The over-inflation of the concept of surveillance, not the recognition of surveillance, but the over-inflation of surveillance, and thus the over-inflation of the supposed remedies explored by art and design to do this. If you have a target that's very large, then it demands very large responses. Um, is, I uh, so argue, too pervasive, and perhaps more importantly, actually politically self-defeating. So it's not that surveillance isn't a problem. Uh, it's that this is extreme, this is much more limited than it would seem as a way to, um, as a way to address it precisely because of this problem of of individuation. So some of these works, um, both excellent and not so excellent, um, have explored this generalized notion of surveillance and how it might be defeated um, through the, the sort of fundamental evolutionary response of camouflage um, and such, for example, masks. So we're all, we've all know several of, of the genres of surveillance that involve the manufacturing of anti-surveillance masks. We saw them in Hong Kong a little while ago. This is, there's ways in which that these are more than sort of art and design projects can be very sort of useful and important urban technologies in their, in their own right. In some ways, um, so in some ways this gesture may speak to context of defending oneself against the gaze of a weaponized machine vision detection system for real. And sometimes it is more about controlling the right, even hypothetically, controlling the right of self-identification in and of itself. I am not who you think I am. I am who I say I am. You can and and I can. My identity cannot be identified through your gaze. Sometimes it's both. The latter is, I guess, sort of more closer to in some ways tra traditional interests of artists who work with the plasticity of identity and for whom and the perform and, and, and the performance of concept and political and so for whom the very idea that there would be an infrastructural system that would literally automate identification especially when identification is understood as being the same thing as identity it's not but when identification is understood as as, as identity and such the danger is not just the danger of identification, but the danger of misidentity. Uh, this is almost by definition an existential danger. Okay, so in relation, however, to the, our 2030 deadline, um, 
uh, I think a different approach is necessary, uh, perhaps in addition. It is not, to try to anticipate some of the but, but, but questions, I am not arguing that now the crisis is so big that now it's OK to acquiesce to the big panopticon and get over it. But that the form and crisis makes clear that to envelope all forms, to define all forms of planetary sensing, index, and calculation technologies, including ones that can be enforced by force, into the general bad category of surveillance and to be resisted and to be and so forth and so on, is both intellectually lethargic and, more importantly, politically reactionary. If the shift from the over-individuated -individu user towards another geopolitics, as we've been starting, in which the geo-governance pays attention instead uh, to the biochemical flows, the movement to prevent the work of sensing infrastructure takes on a very different tone. In the context in which that geopolitical shift has, it would work, in which the object of, in, of the object of governance is those geopolitical flows as well, the governance of those geopolitical flows is dependent upon, in its very capacity to do anything, upon the sensing, indexing, and modeling of those flows itself. Then to defeat and resist that capacity for sensing has a very different valence than we may than we might sort of think. What does it mean, for example? for a very large industrial platform to mask and, dis and distort its reporting data to try to fool the system into what's going on. So to hack the surveillance governance was Volkswagen's plan for dealing with vehicle emissions. This is the corporate version of the surveillance mask. To mask the location and identity of a private transaction, that's Apple's tax strategy which is, in essence, a giant VPN that locates them in Ireland. Here are the, sometimes the ugly connotations of surveillance as is representing all forms of data sensing and modeling and recursive feedback immediately foreclose all of the, and disqualify all of the positive uses that we might frame for them. The politics of this is, is far less clear in that way. So. Now back to our climate science and earth science. Again, based on our axiom that the very idea of climate change is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. Does this mean that climate change data and modeling is really just surveillance science? Should we encrypt all of our emissions? Should we use encryptions to make emissions unaccountable? So you see where I'm going. The, one, the worries that we have in sort of seeing the larger and difficult issues, all of these through the reflexive trope of the panopticon, means establishing a kind of first premise baseline common sense that the politically pervesive, per, the, the, with the presumption that the politically progressive stack geopolitics is foremost about preventing the widespread use of sensing and big data. If so, this makes the development of any really workable, enforceable 21st century, 22nd century, I'd like to hope that there is such a thing, model for the rational, equitable application of planetary scale computation, very, very difficult. The planetary scale computation that we want would inevitably include things that, that through this view would be under, could be easily understood as surveillance we will be much poorer if the pre prevention of perceived harm sabotages the blossoming of, in fact, what is needed. So in relationship to the, the not entirely European, but um, the sort of the Western and American uh, notion of to take back our data, that the real issue here is, is that the data that has been gathered is in the wrong hands. That's, in fact, maybe true. Um, but that if we, whoever we is, who can take this data back and would have some sort of other control on it that we could, that we would prevent these bad things from happening. And hopefully the second part of this and do better things with it, this makes, this is not at all 
a, a irrational or inappropriate sort of response. The problem is that many of the data, the data that we have that we would take back, is not really the data that we would need. This is the other problem of this, the legacy of the over-individuation and the use of the planetary computation as well. Um, data about individual desire patterns, even if you, we were to take it back and do something with it, it's actually not particularly useful to do the things that we need the planetary scale computation to do. It's not just that we need to take back the data that we have. We need different data about different things. Or there needs to be data, different data about different things. Whoever is taking it from whom. So the first step is then is to rotate the rotate the mechanism, not towards the, not towards a more personalized, less restrictive medium, amplifying the the re releasing the restraints of self-expression, nor calibrating existing platforms back to comfortable, familiar models that lawyers can grasp and pilot, nor towards just generalized systemic blindness, that it, 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 the system can't know anything and therefore can't act on anything, nor towards state capture, but towards something that constitutes the mediation, composition, and governance of those geoecologic and geoeconomic flows as the object of the knowledge itself. That is the thing, that is the data that we need to produce, that is the data that we need to model. The data about ourselves, the counter weaponization of the data about ourselves is uh, a bit of a sideshow in relationship to what is really going on. Now, I want to speak then to the, this question of the, the weight of that. It is for sure that uh, a planetary scale computational apparatus that would have the function, capacity for the function of governing at this level of granularity would be something that is ex extraordinarily ecologically expensive. I would hypothesize, though, that it probably doesn't need to be any bigger than what we already have in some respects in terms of its total carbon footprint, in terms of its total energy use, in terms of its total material foot footprint. What we have is sort of enormous. The problem is not that it's not big enough, it's that we're using it for such stupid things. Um, and so once again, it is and questioning the real issue of the ecological cost of planetary scale computation. It has everything to do with what are we using it for, the priorities of application. And as, as said, total weights and costs of all of the Earth's sensors and satellites and servers that we have is insignificant. It, it is, is a rounding error compared to the true carbon and energy cost of computing human self-expression. It wasn't climate science uh, that broke the internet. It was the semiotics of celebrity bodies. The hot heaving cloud engine is stoked in pursuits of moments of apparently meaningful performance, but really of fleeting significance. And the same distortion of this, in the, the same distortion of investments drives our politics. Um, again, to put it directly, remarking that the stack takes so much energy we need to decomputationalize it is true, but a, a far too blunt and low resolution observation. Again, what we use the computation for is the issue. And today, the performance and contestation of the subjective identity of individual people is what we're using it for. And this is not the best use of the teraflops. Planetary scale self-sensing does not cause climate change. In essence, culture does. Here's what I found. This is the thing about the relationship of means. Uh, this was the, this tree planting negative carbon emissions. So it's too expensive. It's three hundred billion dollars. Uh, Five hundred wealthiest people gain two hundred trillion dollars a year. It's not that we don't have the means. It's that it's, it's being misallocated. <clears throat> All right. 
should the I want us to then speak to a little bit of the on the economic question here. Um, part of the ways in which the, the economics should work here is 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 as we sort of identified, part of the thing that is holding back or making less likely deployment of the technical means that we do have in order to guarantee the sort of viability is that um, the ways in which we are the ontologies of value, the ways in which we structure the, how it is to something is remunerated or identified as value, are ones that are poor, that are poorly tuned towards uh, truly understanding the value of, of what those what those actions and services. Um, might be uh, in, in this way. Now, this then I want to sort of shift, re relate this question to the one of, of the ways in which the more conservative technology philosophy of technology sees machines primarily or even exclusively as um, what we might call sort of batteries of value. They're simply something that will absorb and contain for a short period of time a, 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 a certain amount. Now. Such uh, technologies in this way may reflect, absorb, and contain the energy of human labor, which is where all value is thought to originate. Everything that happens is really at the sort of source of human labor. Human labor seems to be a very presumptuous conclusion. Uh, and how to inter in terms of how to interpret actual batteries in terms of uh, the battery theory of value is a sort of an, an, another another question. Um, so. I, as to be clear, I don't hold to this uh, battery theory of technology, but it's impossible at the same time to not see a direct link between, on the one hand, um, uh, the value uh, uh, that, that is what money is supposed to represent. Like, what is what is a dollar? There's a token of a dollar in a piece of paper, but what is the dollar and what is the amount of value that this dollar is supposed to represent? And energy. The amount of energy that's actually that actually required f to make something, that in some sort of way that's both efficient or inefficient, that value is referred to in this this kind of, in this sort of way. So, it's hard not to. But value is not then just about energy storage. Um, it has to do with um, the ways in which it is uh, produced in other forms of ways and transferences of abstraction, of monitor, motoring and writing and plowing and drawing and coding and lifting sort of weights. And if we were to be able to, were able to identify that value across different forms of these uh, assembly, automated assemblies change, then the question of even what the, the value tokens are representing in the first place uh, may appear uh, quite different. And it may be this is, becomes the basis by which that alternative geoeconomics becomes possible, because its, in, its initial reference is less convoluted. OK, now, taking that principle then, uh, and this question of the, the or rethinking of the surveillance back up to this, uh, what sort of regime are we talking about here? Um, it has to do what we're sort of going directly towards is some form of a planetary scale sensing and calculation infrastructure, not just one, but lots of them. And today, we already have lots of them. It's not as though we're sort of talking about something hypothetically to be composed in the future. We have them. We're just using them for weird different kinds of things. And so, uh, and they have different capacities. So the, the, the comparison that I'll make quickly is between two of them, the, uh, the, 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 the essentially pervasive Earth, uh, Earth planetary modeling system that we use for the calculation of any number of forms of, of the uh, climatic profiles of the Earth on the one hand, and the global financial system on the other, an equally uh, uh, ubiquitous form of planetary scale computation, but ones in which that have very different sorts of references and capacities um, in, in this world. So the global financial system identifies, enumerates, tabulates, and defends, and makes enormous bets on the store of value that supposedly already exists in the world and as the world. Its financial ontology of value is obviously open to dispute. But it, it, it works not only as a medium for the circulation of value as it's construed, but also as a platform for the formulations of models of the present that inform models of the future on which predictive bets are made. 
this is the thing that we predict is most likely to happen. That's where the money goes. That bends what is most likely to happen. It is in this sense and bends those markets towards its rationale. The global financial crisis is in the terms of the, the, book, the excellent book by Donald McKenzie. It is an engine, not a camera. It causes the things to happen rather than simply representing them in this way. I want to make an argument that is, this is, take this as, as a sort of thing, but to take it a step further, that is, in fact, it's an engine because it's a camera, that one is dependent on the other. And this tells us something about what the climatic uh, version of planetary scale computation to do. It is only because of the financial system is because of the accumulation of transactions made in and its ability to sense transactions made end to end with these abstracted units of value that, and organize these into these sprawling interfaces of global financial media. WeChat pay, global ledgers, points of sale statements, accounts, et cetera, et cetera. That it's able to track and index all of these, these indices and events at these different kinds of scale, that its predictive models have the perceptual scope necessary to work. It is only because it has this granular capacity to index and fetch what's going on that it's able to make these predictive models. Those predictive models that then bend back to cause and transform what it's describing. If it's only an engine, it can't do that. So moreover, because each of those points those ledgers and points of sales and account structures are not just events to be read. They are also media through which information can be written. They are read-write media. Because they are read-write media, that this recursivity between the predictive and uh, projective model can actually work. The recursivity of the event in the medium gives the model itself the seat of governance. That's kind of what we need, the ecological version of planetary scale computation to be able to do in some way. Another mode of planetary scale sensing and calculation is climate modeling, from which we get this notion of climate change, earth system sciences, and so forth, which have their own history of sensing and indexing and storing and transmitting media, which also, in a way, attempt to, would like to become an engine because a camera, but they're not. Through their models of the future, albeit with far less authority. It would be nice if the descriptive and predictive models of how Earth's climate systems are operating and what the, the statistically, statistically confident conviction of what they are likely to do next had a similar capacity for this recursivity. If the Earth system could not only describe what's going on, but we could recursively bend back and transform what's going on, like the financial system can both describe what's going on and bend back to enforce to transform what's going on through the prediction, then you then it has force rather than simply the capacity for authoritative representation. Both of these twin projects of planetary simulation are, in a way, kind of fighting it out uh, in real ways. And sort of everything is at stake. So this is, again, why this question of surveillance really matters. Um, so what Paul Edwards called the vast machine of, of this planet is conceived in this way is not only the construction of all of this instrumental and sensing media, all the so sub-oceanic waves, terrestrial epidermis, atmospheric and orbital antenna, and so forth. More importantly, it is the potential amalgamation of both the Earth as a vast machine and the, the sensory apparatus that is this prosthesis of the Earth as it comes to know itself as a, as a, as a kind of prosthetic secondary machine in and on the Earth to these to be able to operate in a greater degree of feedback rec recursivity from the other. Climate science is able to describe this system. It, 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 it can describe it. It does not have the effector function of cybernetics to actually act back upon and have any capacity for direct control in the same way that financial systems do. 
So what I'm arguing is not the financialization of the ecology, but rather that the ecology would, that the financialization itself would be subsumed under in this way. The climatic average senses and construes the diversity effect and the correlation between them. So it's, and in many ways, it's, it's um, part of the reason is because the climatic system actually has a much harder job to do than the financial system. Because the financial system is making up what's valuable, whatever it says is valuable is valuable. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's a, you know, it is absolutely a kind of social construction in this sort of regard. Climatic systems don't have this luxury. Molecules, in a way, are, are what they are. They are, as we've been talking, indifferent to the, uh, to the glossary that we might uh, project upon them. And so the, 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 the in intensity and responsibility and difficulty of actually producing a realistic interpretation of them is orders of magnitude more difficult for climate science than it is financial science system because its moving target is actually real. Um, it has an objective standard that economic models don't need to parse. Um, but the point about this governing recursivity is it, it could be sort of put simply this way. It's because the sensing media of Earth systems are not read-write media in the same way that the sensing systems of financial planetary scale computation are read-write media. The, in the Earth's case, they are potentially read-only. Um, they have, because of this, this absence of a capacity to recursively act back upon the ecological effects that they model. Right? Is it clear? No. In my suggestion, like they should, though, <laughs> I hear many uh, right thinking, good hearted people suggest that actually that's a nightmare, uh, what you say. Stop saying that. Um, but important ways. I mean, that this recursion is exactly what we want in some form. We want our climate models uh, that demonstrate looming systemic catastrophic risk to have the capacity for some granular level feedback onto the ecology itself in the same way that financial models of risk on transactions on that they observe and directly administer. They has to have this capacity to act back upon it. This is one of the criteria I will offer of whatever that different form of geopolitics and geoeconomics and geotechnology might be. Now, in response to our, the good-hearted uh, cautionary uh, per, the caution person of more caution than I, I don't see this as, quote, a biological and biopolitical enclosure of the natural outside, um, as it was described to, as this was described to me by someone, but rather as the means to artificially organize artificial cognitive abstraction, that is what the planetary scale computation does, so as to predict the effects of these fundamentally entangled waves of production, metabolism, mediation, as such. At stake is, in the most direct sense, the ability of the Earth's existing ecosystems to survive the evolutionary fact of our sapiens. Now, in this way, um, we would cons consider not only how the geotechnics of Earth systems can be made recursive in some way through the future models of risk um, and collapse and how those can enforce themselves into the present, but also how our climatic models can use, recuperate, absorb, commission, capture the now thereby once this comes, the, a, a, the forms of the financial apparatus that are now internalized into the ecological sensing mechanism. It's not that the ecological system becomes financialized, but rather the other way around. How it is that as that Earth science system incorporates and internalizes the, the media of that other form of planetary scale computation of the 
financial system, steering it, sensing it, indexing, and storing your value according to quite different definitions and ontologies and, 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 and motivations between these living, living beings in this way. So the implication then for us is then um, uh, to imagine these, but also identify where it already exists. It doesn't need to be invented de facto. It needs to be sort of <coughs> repurposed such that they can repurpose for this sort of outcome so that we might draw our, the implications of these trophic cascades. So to, to close this, whereas someone like the late Paul Virilio, who I've written about quite a bit, um, and I should say, I, you know, I still I always think that Virilio's descriptions of our circumstance have a, a kind of a kind of extraordinarily vibrant, c compelling complexity to them. Um, I admit that I sort of have read him a bit perversely. I, he, Virilio to me is he's trying to describe what he feels is the absolute worst possible thing. And he describes it in incredibly beautiful, lurid detail. But for me, I read a bit like sort of like her, seeing like Hieronymus Bosch paintings that are supposed to make you not want to go to hell. To me, it was like <laughs> exactly. So it, uh, just to be, just to come clean on this as well. So whereas someone like Virilio might have seen this kind of recursion that we're talking about here as a catastrophic capture of the molecular realm by military supervision. And others might see it as sort of, see it, their initial thought or initial verse is like this, what you're talking about is the subsumption of climate modeling infrastructure into and by the extrinsic economic logic of financial sensing and modeling. That you're talking about the, the or, that it, it is a comprehensive financialization of the capacity for ecologic modeling. And she's like, no, it's actually what she's is the opposite of this, the inverse of this, exactly. It's instead to emphasize a different relation. We want to design for the subordination and inclusion of financial media into uh, a viable planetary geoeconomics whose models attend to the abstractor and matter in different ways. It is the financial media becomes part of it. There is only an ecological economics in this way. It, the, the inclusion and subordination is backwards. The master-slave dynamic, if you like, whatever. So we sit at this point. Here's my last point, second to last point. We sit at this point where, where, do we, where does design sit? It's like, so the designer, the, deci the designator, sits at certain points within these cascades where those cascades produce abstractions about themselves. Right? We've talked about how all these sort of nodes along the way, but these two have a kind of abstraction about the whole process. All of this assumes, in a way, that the energy and resource intensive developments of what we're talking about, that the whole, the continuance of what we're talking about planetary scale computation does not finally overwhelm everything such that it collapses the economy into, and, and everything along with it, into these data center shaped ruins uh, for the future giant cockroaches to inhabit. Um, instead, the interest that it would steer this apparatus obviously to a far, more, far better purpose uh, on behalf of that different terraforming project around as well. So last point, and a bit tangential on this, uh, uh, on this as well, but something that had been, I'll summarize this, don't worry. Um, <laughs> It was discussion I was sort of having with friends and I uh, uh, sort of around the, at what point does it, so I'm, I'm moving away from this subordination of the, you get the idea that the, the, in these two forms of the planetary scale computation, we need a form of an ecolo the mo ecological modeling form of planetary scale computation needs to subordinate the financial model into itself such that it's reorganizing its ontologies of values and repurposing its rewriting so that it can actually act back upon and to change the things according to its model in the same way the financial sort of things does as well. The question we were talking about here had to do with like, at what point does it become what point do, does, does the question of force and the rule of force 
within ecological management become something that is militarized. Now, there is a, sort of a book, look at the climate leviathan by people who are talking about different forms of, uh, was a book I was really excited about and what it was not less excited about before I read it than after I read it. It was another one of these things where like, I, it, it ended up convincing me of the, what it was trying to dis, dissuade me of. Like the scenario was describing was the end. It's like, yeah, well, that would be, that'd be okay. So you know, the warning didn't work. It actually sort of sent sort of different ideas. But at a certain point by which um, uh, the, the enforcement of the kind of structure by, uh, the enforcement of, 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 of the ecological management system by force and by the military, the role of the military, in essence, in this kind of process, um, something that would need to be uh, need to be sort of considered uh, considered uh, soon, probably um, sooner rather than later. And I was sort of thinking about this in terms of the um, Green New Deal, in which we were sort of seeing not, not only in the United States but just around Europe. And thinking like this is actually quite, there's quite interesting thing going on here. One of the interesting things about um, uh, Green New Deal is that it exemplifies a, 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 a perhaps more common sense notion that the actual job of the government is to uh, take care of the ecosystem. Like that this is now the thing you're supposed to be doing. It's not just that you need to make sure that the trains run on time and to make sure that the hospitals work and to make sure that you have contract rights and to sponsor the World Cup team and whatever. But now the job of the government in this sense is this management of the of the of the ecosystem. This this is a tilt towards the kind of shift towards the this uh, eco geopolitics that we're that we're that we're talking about here as well. Yep. At what point then does this idea that um, the that the government and restructuring of this as well? How at what point does the mil does the the fact that the military is actually part of the government and that if the government's job is this enforcement of the system, does that, that mean that the, it's also the job of the military's job to enforce the system um, come into play? Anyway, different open question. So we'll leave that for open mic night. OK, so let's, um, let's open, up the, open up the conversation. I'm going to go to this side because I don't want you obsessing about that. It's sort, of, it's sort of written there as well. That's not sort of the point. All right, so that's my, that's what I have to say about that. Pierce. Okay, so these, these are, these are all just um, questions that the answer is is like yes to the question. We'll see about well, that. Like, <laughs> like what, or, what, um, uh, and also think well, they're, they're all really short. Um, also, like the microphone thing makes it like a hub and spoke kind of thing, and maybe like you know. It's we have we have we have we have, a, we, we have a few we have a few of the microphones, so they can stay in motion. So, um, so there's like there's like I have like four of them. And you can also, if you want, by all means, you don't have to direct all these comments at me. So your hub and spoke. Ask ask. You can ask provide something. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, one is so like the, the the refrain is like away from individuation. And it's still like towards what? Um, that's just like one question. These these um, the, these geo biochemical flows themselves, the things that we're the things that we think this chain of signification is eventually going to get to, at the end of the line. We we in fact that becomes the thing itself, right? That's the object of the of the governance rather than something that is epiphenomenal of the object of governance. Um, so like maybe adding like which is just like at like. Almost just bookmarking it or flagging it for like what we would add specificity to, uh, like what this guy Noah Rayford was, is like a futurist that works in, in Dubai and he was talking about what kind of pre-legal technologies that they would like always target pre-legal technologies, which I think is a really interesting way of conceptualizing our projects. Like what, not to like sort of rehearse the blockchain thing again, and just do something that's very of the moment. Um, and then has no like long term durability, but just thinking about pre legal technologies, I think it's an interesting. I, I don't know. The blockchain doesn't have. A, it's just. It just. Its future is probably quite different than what we. Well, there saw, was in what we thought it was. That's all I mean. It's like in twenty sixteen or new normal. That was like a pre. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, no, but I mean, look, I mean, like the his, yeah. for the history of writing, the first form of writing was accounting. Yeah. And blockchain is basically 
cool kids working on avant-garde accounting. And the first name. So the, the fact that it wouldn't have that has doesn't should have legs is actually there's some precedent here for accounting as a primordial form of inscription. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean to no, no, parenthesize this as well. Okay, so what, how does so Noah's how is Noah's notion of pre-legal different than what we talked about as a legal in I think stack, it's just that. I think stack. it's just framing it as a question. Yeah, oh. it's, it's so the a legal, I mean, in this, the way in which I talked about this, and I said there's no different, a legal technology refers to something, a form of, of something, it doesn't have to be a technology, it could be something else that's neither legal or not legal. It just doesn't exist, it, the, the law can't see it. Yeah. It doesn't know, it doesn't have a word for it right, yet. Yeah. It doesn't know what it is yet, and so it, it hasn't, in fact, been figured out. Yeah. So for now, it's not against the law, so you can do it, but it's not exactly legal either. So you know, file sharing for a long time was an illegal yeah. technology, and especially they have ones in ways they end up sort of bending the legal technologies in their direction in ways that are sort of useful. So sort of finding these forms that are, so uh, the presumption that the things that we should be um, sort of collecting as the potential building blocks here are things that could be reasonably described as illegal forms or that that's a good thing to look for, I, yeah. would, I would agree. Just a flagging of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Um, Parts of it, it depends on what we mean. I guess I, I'm sort of trying to argue for, on the one hand, actually a much more delimited definition of what we really mean by surveillance, or sort of just cautioning against the overinflation of this term, but also talking about ways in which that it's uh, uh, it, 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 the, the sort of presumption of thinking about it entirely in terms of this, uh, of, of a kind of negative panoptic, uh, 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 sort of uh, unsolicited and unwarranted uh, voyeurism on part of the some kind of you know, Oedipal overlord is right. not going to get us very far in terms of actually getting us towards the geotechnological and geoeconomic system that we actually want, which would, by de would by almost by definition be built upon all forms of mechanisms that would be, could be identified as surveillance mechanisms one way or another. They're just not necessarily surveillance of us. That's the thing. It's not, it's like, surve and this goes to your point about like, you know, these carbon, you know, the, the sort of carbon budgets of like, you've thrown away too many candy wrappers this month, you're the problem. Um, the, the training of these things onto individual people, onto people at all, but onto individual people um, is, is where is, is kind of the shift here as well. And so I, it's a movement of, I guess in the, in the most sense, it's a movement of the, what the surveillance is surveilling uh, away from us rather than a response to surveillance by a kind of Counter weaponizing and refortification of the individual as this, you know, as this, as the sovereign units are saying, it's actually not about us at well. And so, in the circumstances we're talking about, at least that I'm sort of saying, it's not one in which it's not the kind of the notion, it's not the sort of eco authoritarian sort of version of this as well, where, you know, every time you throw something away in the wrong trash can, you get an electric shock or, you, or something like this. You're not the issue. You're not the issue, right? You're not the thing being observed. You're not the object of governance in this way. And so, you know, you're not being surveyed in the same way. Like today, we're not surveilling most of everything else. So, yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I think we get that that is not the type of surveillance that we want to design. But the fact that there is a risk that that is the type of surveillance that might become become real. Makes, yes, because because sort of because there's this tenacious hold on the premise that the individual individuated subject is really the the core unit here yeah, and as long as we that, as, think, as long yeah. as that is held so, to, so tightly any of the things that are brought to bear to try to mediate this problem will bend to that onto that as the thing that they're interested in because that's what we're forcing right and so we and so, so like the disindividuation is that's why I talked about it first it's it's the first principle that has that makes any of the rest of this impossible without that None of the rest will work, for sure. Yeah, and I think for us, that's clear. This is not maybe an arena for, yeah. that we are interested in playing in, but I think because of that risk and reason, the a legal arena of ma masking individuated surveillance is still an interesting arena that needs to sort of stay in play. Again, not for us, perhaps, but because yeah. of the risk of. I'm, I'm not I, it, sure. I, it, it's it's there's interesting ways it, it can work in interesting ways on lots of different levels from something that's actually uh, like a. I mean, the, the, the amazing technical arms race that we saw in Hong Kong 
a few months ago around, specifically around these issues of, of visibility, transparency, opacity, observability, blinding police with too much light. I mean, it's just like amazing, right? I mean, just um, in, sort of in and of itself. So I'm not suggesting in any way that, these, that those things are only operating in the realm of some sort of, um, sort of you know, uh, symbolic playtime, quite at all. And it is these kind of, these questions of what sees what, what's opaque to what, what's transparent to what, what's visible to what, what can see what in those sort of ways is, is also, a, you know, in, in addition to being obviously that's the direction by which the evolution of machine vision will go. It's all about, you know, as, as many, as lots of things are able to see lots of other things, there will be this kind of same sort of optical perceptual arms race between like of camouflage and display, things that want to be seen, making sure they are things, seem not want to be seen being camouflaged. And it'll make all kinds of weird displays and camouflage that make no sense to us because we're not the one it's trying to prevent from looking at it. It's, it's trying to prevent being looked at by something that doesn't even see the world the way that we see, we see the world. Um, and so without a doubt, this question of this, this, this sort of um, uh, the, uh, the composition of artificial vision in this regard includes, not just as a part of it, but as a fundamental part of it, the prevention or the coordination of not just how to see, but how to be seen. Yes. Yeah. And so it's like right now we have like the individual and then we have like geochemical flows, but like just wanting to add, we need to start adding names to other, other things. That's all, that's, that, that's what I would say to that. Like it's at some point we start giving a bunch of new names to objects of surveillance that we think are better um, suited to start to, to survey, to start surveilling. And we have a lot of those already. Yeah. I mean, so I guess what I'm su suggesting is that many of this is already sort of, it's not sort of composing this, a lot of this sort of available. It's why I kind of ended with this idea of the trying to understand the the, uh, the, sort of the ways in which we've already constructed infrastructural apparatuses that allow the planet to represent and model itself in some way. There are already a glossary. There's already a taxonomy. There's already conditions. We kind of like, we have a good rough draft of what some of those things are uh, already. We, the, the problem is again that that descriptive model can't do anything about its representation. It can't act back upon that question in the same way that financial media could. But uh, it, it's for sure incomplete. So uh, new, adding to the list of things is quite, probably a good starting point for sure. To go back a little bit with, with the shifting of um, the surveillance, shifting from the individual perspective with the mm. paper can um, to a more, um, to different types of data, because that one or, or the data that we have is not enough on individuals. It's just not that useful. Yeah, it's not useful. I'm just wondering, isn't it, in a way, isn't that good? Isn't it easier if we're shifting away from the individual, maybe we'll care less? About, about surveillance? Ta about taking, if the surveillance is not about us, yeah. we would probably care less about the surveillance, at least, at least in not the same, we care about it differently in yeah. the same way. But will the surveillance yeah, yeah, still that, be that's okay. what I'm saying, is like yeah. if you great, take back our data, uh, yeah. that's, act that's fine, but the data is actually about the wrong thing. And, and again, I just wanted to, yeah, and yeah. It, yes, yes. But yes, is yes, it yes, still yes, about yes. us if it's not um, individual behaviors, preferences. It can be. Again, I, I, it's, it's, I'm not trying to exclude humans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. actual Homo sapiens, no, no, no. from this from yeah. this as well. Or even sometimes, you know, individual Homo sapiens or groups of them or swarms of them or however you want to sort of things as well as mm -hmm. a as this precondition. But yep. rather than, uh, but how we are, uh, how we, uh, how we are represented and observed. And even you know made into part of the system would be in a, uh, clearly in a way that's quite different from this, mm -hmm. um, from the form that were th th in the past. And, and so the story about this, the Foucauldian story of the Panopticon, a mechanism, an architecture for the individuation of human bodies, so that individuated human bodies can be observed in this way, and can be diagnosed as the base unit of this form of knowledge of criminology. Um, would require a, a different founding myth because these individual cases of individual humans is no longer really the, 
the main is no longer the base unit. I, and are you? Um, I think I, I remember David Keith talking a little bit about um, w one of the problems with these solutions, with this, this geotechnical solutions that that we're talking, is that it could drive the attention of. Um, um, all right, we'll, we'll have the solution at some point, so we can continue doing. We do whatever we want, whatever because eventually yeah. it'll be day or six months. Ago. Yeah, it'll be sunny. Um, because it'll be, yeah, yeah, this is a, this is this is a sort of a problem. But that's why I tried to take such pains yesterday to repeat the point that um, on the one hand, I, I would I disagree with the idea that um, that the, the entertaining and understanding of how it is that we could in essence cut to the chase. Uh, and act directly upon, and conceptualize the governance, acting directly upon the planetary geochemistry that really is, is that, that is, has emerged as the real sort of, sort of is, issue here, um, uh, is one that should um, uh, 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 prevent any of these transformations from sort of taking place. Is, it, is, is, is uh, I, there's a ways in which some critics of this technology are, are rightfully, I think, uh, concerned about its exploration in this regard because they fear that, in a way, not only that it would draw attention away from the changes that need to have happen, and it ends up becoming this kind of aspirational placebo, hypothetical placebo, but also that um, maybe it works. This is also a problem for some like maybe it actually could solve this problem without changing the political economic structure. And that's also a fear. Not only that it would fool us you're thinking we could, but that it actually could, and that also might be, on, that also might be unacceptable. And then you've got, like I was saying, it's like certain forms of the eco-modernist camp. We're arguing, it's like the good news is that you can implement these technical solutions without having to transform the political and economic system. That's, that's actually the good news, not the bad news. I think they're both wrong. The, the starting point to working with this is the presumption that there is no way Part of the reason I, you know, I, I have some confidence in the idea that this implementation, I mean, just repeating what we said yesterday, but some confidence in the implementation of the geotechnology is the precondition for the emergence of the geopolitics that we would need is because I don't think it's remotely possible that we could implement the geotechnology that we're talking about in such a way that would not have fundamentally transformative effects on the geopolitics and geoeconomics because there's absolutely no way that the current system would be able to govern, administer, and pilot that system. It would require and therefore produce the geopolitics and geoeconomics that's necessary to drive, that's necessary to drive it and, and in a the, sense. The and so that, that's why uh, this is sort of this yeah. clear, I just want to repeat the point because sometimes when I talk about this stuff, there's a presumption that I am saying what, you, uh, what you're, you're worried that I'm saying, and I'm, I'm saying something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have comments. Uh, yes, please. I think the uh, the topic of uh, human surveillance or surveillance applied to humans um, it's like been around from since yesterday, and I think there's 15th so, century. But yeah. yeah, but yeah. here, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. There are some like. Um, Kind of subtleties to be made, like Without for example, absolutely. I don't know. There's a difference uh, between um, like the problem is surveillance human subjectivity, and that's that's not the kind of inform information we need. Yes, right. Or the problem is um, a human performances, like its actual efficiencies, like um, its digestive system. The its heart rate, um, mm -hmm. it's it's more material and um, right quantitative quantified self kind of exactly stuff. yeah yeah huh? so where the surveillance is useful there or sure. interesting in yeah I think it is useful there but it's it's in a different way and I I guess it's like um, because there you have this sort of this regime of observation that's sort of more properly matched to the the unit of his analysis, but it's still actually sort of wrong. And still, I, I would argue, even in the quantified self, it's still way too over individuated in this regard, in, in this in this way. And it <laughs> oh shit, sorry, it starts getting more interesting when it becomes more disindividuated. 
it surveys as well. And so yeah, it's yeah. like a, it's a byproduct, human uh, surveillance or its performance, uh, the surveillance of its performance is a byproduct of a gener more generalized uh, surveillance. Uh, it can be so. The, yeah, it's, yes, but it's the, demotivated. It can be, yeah. Uh, but I guess I would put it, I would sort of put it this way. And, and as I talked about this in the the user layer chapter uh, in this in the stack, there's a way in which at sort of a low resolution, there's quanti quantified self measurements have a, an effect that's similar to what Lacan identified in the mirror stage of development. Like we see a reflection of ourselves as an individual, as the individual that is being measured. And it comes to convince us that we are more individual than we actually are uh, because we are, see ourselves re quantitatively reflected in this shadow. The thing is, it, at, at, a more, at, a, at a higher level, if you begin to add more and more, let's say more and more data points to that representation, uh, epidemiological data, uh, uh, pollen counting, all kinds of things that have to do with the parts of the, your microbial biome, all kinds of things that like the more and more that you add to this sort of this representation of this sort of that are act that are also sort of acting upon you that boundaries of the you and the not you get more fuzzy which is and good so, yes and so even that end of you got the, the sort of the dissolution of this individuation so it, it, it's, it you can think of it as kind of an arc like a certain amount of indi a certain amount of quantified self information you have this expanded sense overinflated sense of self which is why quantified self Technologies are so popular with the sort of X-Men reading of Atlas Shrugged crowd. But the more data that you add to it, you have this collapse of that sense of identity and identification. And then it, and you have this disindividuation dis into the uh, ambient ecological conditions of which you are a temporary assemblage, which is less popular. Apple Watch doesn't have that yet. <laughs> <laughs> However, nowadays, nowadays um, like um, yeah, humans do possess uh, the tools, like I don't know, my smartphone or whatever, mm -hmm. different kinds of technologies that applies to them. Yeah, which. Um, they can be are useful. Quite useful. Yeah, yeah. They can. They can be useful. I don't have friends. But I think they're useful in a sense. They're useful because they, in a, when they are useful, they're useful in that they provide a kind of external view of yourself, right? When you're tracking how much you eat. You realize I'm eating eight, yeah, nine hundred calories more than I thought I was eating, right? Your the, your intuitive sense of how sort of how things work. You get. It, you have this external view, and you begin to see yourself from this outside in a way that can be quite. Uh, Disorienting, but also probably instructive in this sense. So I, I'm not I, I have at it. I'm not arguing against that. I'm not arguing that the surveillance of individuals should be prohibited. I'm just saying is that the understanding of all surveillance is essentially about individuation is part of is is a, a big part of how we are misusing misusing it. But it's I'm not trying to I'm not trying to prohibit it. But it's a it's an issue of or it's like a problem of uh, subjectivity or it's a problem of granularity both um, and in the case of the second one isn't the universal capacity of certain information uh, which pose in the same level like I don't know a cat or certain animal mm -hmm. uh, like in, uh, puts in the same level a human Right. Uh, in a cat, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the certain sort of, of yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. we share more more DNA with other mammals than we do with uh, oak trees, but we do share DNA with oak trees. Is it more? I guess is uh, I would, yeah. Like okay. Interesting or useful in a way? Yeah. That because it's, I think because there is this external view in this way, I think would be the point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There is a kind of grassroots movement that is about citizens surveilling each other or state. I, th I think it's called surveillance. They, they can also me measure um, ke chemical levels in the cities. Do you think this is a surveillance that should be encouraged or it misses the point exactly mm -hmm. as the, the state surveillance? Uh. No, 
No, this is citizen surveillance. Do you mean sort of people going around and doing like air quality measurements and then aggregating yeah. these together into public yeah. data yes, sets, yes. or do you mean people like listening in on each other's phone calls and calling the cops? Uh, I think it's both. Oh, uh, okay. uh, especially <laughs> uh, uh, people uh, re recording the police officers who arrest them or. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, lo there's lots of examples that we can. I, I'm not sort of, if you've got the sense that I'm somehow that my, my arguments on behalf of my arguments against the critique of surveillance was somehow arguing for the elimination of all these forms of information gathering I, I, I'm, I've been misunderstood uh, yes I, there, there's all, there I'm not sure we've got all the examples but a lot of things you mentioned are, are clearly sort of positive forms of the way this would sort of work the issue with the sort of surveillance versus surveillance over and under has to do with nobody can really agree up like who's subordinate to who like if you have the idea that those who are on those who have less power should have absolute transparency looking at those who do have power so WikiLeaks sort of model like th those in positions of power should be absolutely exposed as a matter of principle and at the same time those who have less power should be utterly opaque to those looking down upon them with the sort of maximal privacy kind of depends on like who you think is above who and no one can agree on this as well so this question of like what the art what the what the press what the the architecture that presumes this up and downness is <clears throat> a matter of some dispute in one way or another and so it's nevertheless you know people can hold this seem to sort of this radical transparency and radical opacity premise uh, simultaneously regardless of how contradictory they might be in practice Though, in many respects, they are quite valid ta strategies and tactics, no doubt. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just had a, 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 um, a question in terms of the, because the, the comparison and, and contrast between the, the financial systems and the earth science systems uh, is interesting and important. And also the, the, the project of having the, making the climate systems read right. Yeah, is, is obviously like uh, I think you're in hinting at this should be part of the solution. Obviously, no, I'm saying it is. Yes, exactly. I'm I'm I'm, I'm describing something. I'm being uh, polemic, but uh, the thing I'm proposing is quite vague. So I want. I'm not vaguely saying something specific. I'm specifically saying something vague. Right. Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So, <laughs> is there any kind of uh, case studies or proto? examples of attempts at doing this successfully of, of making these systems read write other than the kind of the ir irony of as more complex models get built mm -hmm. they actually start predict or sensing their, their own contribution to the to the yeah I, so i i, I want to sort of l let me let me be clear a little bit of what i mean by the read write thing by, by the read write thing here i think what would be inclusive in what i'm sort of proposing here is any way in which the direct implications of the descriptive of a predictive model um, that those implications and the ch and the decision made about what is to be done in relation to those implications can be uh, actuated and enforced. There's some sort of actuation function around this as well, which could include like not burning a rainforest. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't involve necessarily that what we need to do is put nano sensors on every leaf and figure out what's going on so that we can send. Uh, satellite rays down to figure out sort of the leaf. It has to do with the, the the governance and the governance and enforceability of the decision itself, right? That's a def, that's a kind of, a, 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 just in terms of the way in which you're sort of thinking through this kind of this this sort of thing. So when you mean read write the, the the fact that our models are telling us that we should be cutting less trees or, or preserve, then something would have to enforce a decision in a more I guess immediate way than the ones we currently. Right, and the same with financial media work this way as well. If, the, if there's transactional data that would imply we need more wood, the more wood gets cut down. It's not like that there's some link between my credit card swipe and the saw that's cutting down the machine. I mean, there kind of is, but that's not the sort of link, the sort of point. If I buy that tape, and it causes you know, this, this thing to sort of happen down the line, there's a way in which that the financial model gets actuated actuated somewhere else. It's not just, it, it, just to be clear, yeah. So then what's currently missing to give these predictions more authority other than the fact that we don't have the, the fictions 
So they're not that we don't have the fictions. We don't have the force. The, the, the point within the system that will actually enforce those implications is unclear. It's missing. This is why I was sort of ending with the, with, with the at what point does the implications of Green New Deal, it, which is a kind of repositioning of the state's function as to manage the ecosystem properly, include all the state, which includes the military, that's one. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of this. I mean this in much more, a much more conjectural sort of, a conjectural sort of way. And but, but that's sort of. Go ahead. Sorry. And the force of the financial system is to simply like the legal structure that protects the, the or that allows these decisions to happen. Like, what is the force, of the enforceability that the financial system currently has to actually make sure? To its ontologies of value. That basically they are that there's a control over the of valuation and price. It's the geoeconomics that has to structure away. So it may be the part of the incorporation of the read write structure that we're talking about in terms of the ecological system. This is what I mean. It's like there's this inclusion and subordination of the financial system into the ecological system may also be very much working around the constitutions of price, price signals and valuation. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to only be this kinds of financialization. I'm sorry, go ahead. To this point, like, is it about the difference in efficiency of the read and write? Because potentially we're already on a trajectory where eventually the, the environmental models will turn out to have been, been writing already because we are part of the, potentially part of the writing. Like, if in 100 years we do have these solutions and we turn the ship 100 around. 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> to really know for sure that it works, you know? But in 10 years, <laughs> in 10 years to put the deadline more realistically. But then the model will have t proven to be, have been writing all along just on a very, on a slower scale while the financial system at mm -hmm. this point is incredibly mm -hmm. fast at the writing. Yeah. So is it maybe yeah, yeah, more yeah. about closing the gap of the efficiency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and this is what I'm saying is, this is why I sort of ended at this point. It's just like, instead of sort of thinking, it's like, look for the places where this is already, be, this is already at work let's let's this is the part we want to stitch together into this sort of thing so again it's not in, in many cases i'm talking about, it's not sort of this proposition for some hypothetical it's rather it's a sort of it's 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 just a re it's a redescription and rediagramming of process in many cases i think your point are already already at work and it may be in some cases just merely a shifting of a figure ground relationship a renomination, as, as Pierce was saying, in one way or another. But perhaps this is it. That like the, the, those climate models have already set in motion the process where there's, they're inviting, inviting the possibility of their capacity for recursivity. What do we need? To, what do we need to do to make good on that invitation? I, I agree with this point. Yeah. Huh? Climate change could be a weapon. It's a weaponized ecosystem. It's a prototype weaponized ecosystem. Climate change is a prototype weapon. It's not a prototype. Why, in what sense is it a prototype? Well, maybe it's not a prototype. It was the early. You see what I mean? Like, well, I guess that's what you would mean. It's like, I mean, also just sort of like, you know, confuses sort of the word. It, it is, you know, in a weird, in, in a highly specific way, the purpose of the terraforming to come is not to prevent climate change. It's to, in essence, to do a better climate change. Is like we can't keep the climate we have. The climate we have is not going to continue. It's not going to work for it. It needs to be changed. And so this question of climate change is not only descriptive, at least in this sense, it's also prescriptive. Whether we like it or not. Yep. Uh, talking about the ontology of the value, is it always yep. about the money or the value can be anything like some? abstraction force that sticks right. together That's everything. What I mean, the so. ontology of value, what I mean is, is in this sense, it, it, you could think of it more in the most direct sense is like the thing that the money, the value that the money is representing. So you could have like a, you could have a dollar bill, I can tear up the dollar bill and now there's one less dollar in the world, whatever a dollar, yeah, I mean, whatever it, dollarness it's, actually is, but the, what does the dollar represent? So it used to, a, a, in ye olden times, represent a certain amount of magic yellow rock. Dig up a certain amount of magic yellow rock, and the dollarness had a correspondence with a certain amount of magic yellow rock, and then you had a piece of paper that represented the dollar, which is an abstraction of amount of value that listed in the magic yellow rock. That's your animism. Yeah. And then we got much more sophisticated, and we made it a silver magic rock. 
Yeah, well, okay. I want to, to go back to so David that's th This is what I'm talking yeah. about, the Are ontology. Now. So what is that ultimate reference? So is it energy? What should it be? Should it be carbon? Should it be energy? Pokemon? I don't know. There's lots of ways in which you could structure these sort of carbon and energy itself in ways in which are, are, there's been you know, a fair number of experiments around this kind of notion. There's probably something to this. Yep, it does. Um, well, that's what I mean. That's, does that answer your question? Yep. OK, good. Uh, I have a question about uh, a concept of digital waste. Yeah. Like we have a problem that uh, we have a planet, and then it's about to ruin because of the waste. That's why we need to create some superstructure, like intangible one, and uh, why we believe that it wouldn't be ruined by digital waste. It will be. It, it would. Be. I, I, do you mean with digital waste? Do you mean like sort of piles oh, of broken, okay. pri like the island of piles of broken phone phones? Well, that's, I mean, no. or, or do you mean Across like probably this the waste as well? But databases more, full of spam. Yeah, what do you mean? Okay. Database, but uh, I don't think that it's like the most refined thing. Uh, I, I was uh, thinking about all this uh, data, like useless one, and if we try to. information about all details to, uh, in order to make our predictive model like, fitted and uh, comprehensive, uh, we need to collect like, really a lot of stuff. And probably it's yeah, also that, in terms of something. Yeah, so that's, that's why we don't do that. Okay. That's why you don't make one giant model that has to know absolutely everything at all point in times, where you have to make a map that is as big as the territory. Uh, don't do that. We, we, and the question is also like what we is um, in terms of the amount of comp per planet, what the amount, I'm not arguing, I think I'm not really arguing for e even any more growth of the planetary scale computation system we have. There's some transformation within it, but more is not, is, I'm not arguing would you need to turn the knob in the more direction and that will solve the problem. The question is, is what are we using this system for? Uh, and, and the generation of waste, both data waste, hardware waste, Time waste he, are he, sort of huge. It's sort of hugely sort of structured. So part of the question is like, you know, financial models don't model absolutely everything. If you go to, you know, large trading houses do have pretty comprehensive predictive maps of the entire market in one way or another, and that they they come in and allow for some of this high speed trading sort of things as well. But we have examples of sort of how to of, of how to do that and how to have how this might happen. We've got lot, you know, there's multiple of them. They don't, you know, they're, they're big and expensive, but they're not big and expensive. You're talking about, they're not big and expensive comparatively to what, they're, what we're asking them to do, which is a lot. Yeah, yeah. But it, again, to be clear, I'm not arguing for this sort of like put sensors on everything, make a, an absolutely you know, maximal high resolution trace of everything that possibly happens. And once we get that done, then the perfect simulation will be able to come into play and, and order everything and stuff like that's 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 not the argument to be clear okay yep. maybe it's a question about uh, surveillance as well because uh, the amount of information which society collects it's increasing mm -hmm. here. yes this with the, and th this has costs and the other cost is again that it's we're producing we're producing this information and generating this data about things about the wrong things, and which the problem being both that the production of the data about the wrong things has has, has real and serious costs, but that the fact that the time and space and energy is being used to produce the thing that is actually not so useful is is taking up all the oxygen, if you like, from what the time thing we should be using to produce something that is useful. So this prevention is also equal to the problem. So I I, I agree. I think you know. So we need to do something. Other than that, um, on one of your slides, you had um, you had two tweets. Uh, two tweets. Uh, one uh, saying that uh, the cost of uh, delaying uh, climate change uh, is three hundred billion dollars or something like that. Another one um, 
saying that the top one percent has gained more money than that in one year. Is that was that? It was it was it was side by side thing. Two yeah. news stories from the same Bloomberg mm -hmm. feed. Some of right. found was there was a it would there was some scheme for. Uh, something I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of the trillion tr plant a trillion trees thing. What? It was that's right. It was the soil remediate. Go ahead, explain the whole thing. Go ahead. It was some sort of. It was some sort of basically of, re of, of sort of re uh, uh, recuperating and remediating the soil in 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 the deserts in the Middle East that would end up being reabsorbing huge amounts of carbon in and of itself and would have this very sort of quick and expensive and, per and sort of capacity as a as a carbon absorption technology, and it was you know, this would have a big effect, a work effect, and would cost three hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. At which point, everyone said, "Like that's, that's insane. That's too much money. Three hundred billion dollars is too expensive." And then, like the next thing we had to do was like, in this short period of time, the the richest two hundred people in the world have you know have earned one point five trillion dollars or something like this. But the point is, it was five times as much. Five times as much as it would have cost to do this right. thing so, yeah, has been yeah. spent on right. so what we might assume are, uh, mm -hmm. at this point, uh, mm -hmm. not exactly necessities uh, yeah. for the so people. So I'm, I'm just yeah. curious if, uh, if how interested we are in exploring this um, issue related to wealth distribution within the context of the Terraform yeah, yeah, project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Because we haven't talked much about it. We have, but just in a different way. Okay. I, w I would sort of say yes, but sure. If you want, if there's ways in which you would, you think that the project should address this in structure more generally, I think it's everything to do with the those recomposition of the geoeconomics that we're because mm -hmm. we have that we're speaking about of. the project being pro egalitarian, but I understood that as a like as a goal rather than the means of getting there. Mm, it could be both. I'm folk. I'm I'm articulating it more as the more as a goal more in the as means, a goal, but not as a, not this so much as. A, yeah, because I think we want to be attentive to the fact that those means and ends are not always um, symmetrical, mm -hmm. not always corresponding with one another. And I think there's even a, a caution. We want to be cautious about the fact that a lot of the this pro, this pro, the problems of the, the 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 of the 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 politics of symbolization, this avatar sort of model that we're talking about. Once the, the part of the problem in this sense is a is a deep presumption that. By the the specific articulation and policing and configuration and exacting of the means, and the intention here that that will be the way to guarantee that the outcomes are exactly as we want them to be, and if they're not the way we want them to be, we must we have gone back. We need to discipline the means a bit more. Lots of ways in which the the relative egalitarianism of the means are utterly different than the ends. You can have lots of very, very egalitarian means that end up in something that is not egalitarian at all. And you can have the quite opposite, where you have sort of uh, arbitrary, autocratic imposition that ends up having extremely egalitarian outcomes, like a piazza in a city. We're going to make this giant open space, and nothing's going to get in the way, and I said so, and thus. And it ends up being the sort of the basis of the demos of the city in a way or another. The correspondence between means and ends we cannot take as necessarily, ne as a necessary relationship between them all. But there's nothing that prevents us from dealing with this question of means or ends as we wish to do, just as long as we're not, as I'm saying, presuming that they must correspond and be symmetrical in order for them to work. Thank you. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. I think to that point, like about wealth distribution and the organization of labor, like the Green New Deal represents the first opportunity in American politics in like a hundred years that there's a shared work that has to do with some that's some kind of meta project. That's a bit much. Sir, you it's <laughs> you think so? It I mean, I think I mean, I'm not an expert. I, okay, but okay. It's, but it, I mean, it's a bit hyperbolic, but yeah. I don't know what would since the since like. Interwar period or post -war. most wars would be well, so a kind a of a, 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 a state-driven matter project that's supposed to incorporate yeah. people into some kind of I don't know, just as a framework for thinking about the relationship between labor, wealth distribution, and ecology. I think it's it's a framework for thinking about. It's on the table, I guess. In, yeah, in the state for sure. Yeah, it yeah. hasn't and, been a discussion. And I and I'm not and I really you know I want to like not be too cynical about it. Sort of at this point, I think there's lot, lots of ways in which different versions of various Green New Deals 
are, are floated that I, there's all kinds of things to be critical about what they include and what they don't include in way or another, but the, there's, there's enough of a, of a family resemblance to what the, the initiative of a kind of societal scale meta project and a shifting of the object of governance towards this ecology that, um, we, that would be much better suited to figure out in ways of to corresponding this project with, with that than trying to, uh, to try to, uh, uh, try to you know, overly define the differences. Um, we may do so in ways that you know, make other GD people upset, but that's okay. Uh, Did you want to say something else about this? Because it, it was the issues of wealth distribution itself that was yeah. sort of part of the kind of structure of this as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I, I would I echo and echo the idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding Nikolai's um, question before about the examples, like I have two things in mind. I would like to to see how far they are from like your take on this. For example, the. Um, like the way UN uh, red program like reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation how they are they have like these values that they call them climate regulation values that they are in a way you know scientifically determined on how much these ecosystems uh, mm -hmm. are valued according to their uh, how much they can determine climate for example right um, like you know one kind and of, carbon pricing schemes are pretty based yeah. on like these ecological services that a mangrove swamp does or something yeah, and so yeah. on yeah, yeah so are this far from your take on you know, like you know or is this kind that's, of a fi that's financialization more, of that's more a direct example of what we might call this financialization of, of the economy. financialization of the ecology and there may be ways in which this leads to something interesting whether this is price on that's predicated on, on a proper price for carbon which would have to be something closer to sixty dollars a a ton not Nine or whatever, yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever it, it, whatever it is now. But more, what I'm trying to suggest is like taking this to the, the next, the next step from this logic would be the other way around, in which it's not that the, you have a financialization of the ecological system by which this the earth sensing system becomes subordinated within the financial, the, the one in terms of these two forms of planetary computation, where the ecological model gets subordinated to the financial one, and you've got you know mangrove swamp derivatives. Uh, sort of being traded this way, but act, but more the other way. More what what does the other way around mean, and what how we would sort of pursue that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm not sure. I understood. Anyway, so the uh, and the second would be how far is this from like, um, I don't know the energy currencies uh, that were proposed um, before the New Deal in the 1920s in the U.S. Like um, you know all this thing that um, energy certificates would replace currency, things like that. Like Howard Scotts. Yeah, there's lot. There's been lots of ex Keller wrote some interesting stuff on the, yeah. the Keller Easterling interesting stuff on the energy curve. There's lots of precedent things as well. I'm not trying to. I, I guess I, I I would caution against. I, I think it's worthy to explore these relationships between these ontologies of value and forms of currency and and how it is that we index these forms of value within this itself as part of the the general question of. Uh, Reconceptualizing the premise of the of the this geoeconomics, so there's not just a distribution of the distribution of value may have everything to do with the redefinition of value, and around this way sort of another, certainly through exploring these these other, other sort of forms. Um, energy is a different sort of weird thing to sort of measure. I think there was a way in which at a at a certain economy in which a lot of labor was based on. At that point, it was on physical labor of people picking things up and moving them around and hammering them. the idea of that value is generated by energy, by you know the sort of physical work was probably more legible, um, uh, and and sort of based on where we imagine this work. The question at this point is, if we want sort of thinking about where the how what are the other places in which value is generated? There may be another logical referent. Carbon. There's arguments to be made as to why carbon might be the one that is probably cleanest and simplest and perhaps most directly effective in that. But um, this, again, this could be part of the, it's part of the story. I mean, if it's part of the story, by all means, let's, let's sort of explore this. I would, I, I, I would do so with, a bit of, with curiosity, but also to assume that like, really the problem is like, instead of having a currency based on gold, we should have one based on carbon, and we, we picked the wrong element, and there really is, is is 
clearly too simple. It would have to be like, what, what happens next? Which could be very interesting. So sure. Hmm? Yeah, so the comment about the financial ecological thing. Yes, please. Um, which connects to what we talked about earlier or, or yesterday, maybe about energy as being, um, you know, there's this mismatch between long term fossil fuel and then what is burned immediately. Yeah. Um, and it is related to finance in the sense that the function that we use to think about time and money is exponential which means that it rewards in an asymmetrical way to take risk today and not invest long term. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't know if Because you, you get this exponential return exactly, because on the sort of interesting Exactly, because you're rewarded for taking risk and that you're more rewarded for uh, not doing you're not You're not rewarded, you're re right, you're rewarded for taking risk, not yeah. rewarded for mitigating risk. Exactly. Unless you're in insurance. Yeah, and there is a lot about also intergenerational equity and all of these things that I just wanted to yeah, 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 and, and I'll talk a little bit some of this on this sort of long-term energy kind of structures of, yeah, of this as well. Uh, of this, yeah. right, so the intergenerational equity, I think, in a weird way, is we've actually sort of approached this in a fairly different way. That th there's ways in which it, I mean, I'll talk about this more, but the idea that if you had a very, very long-term, if you sort of the energy was the system was modeled over very, very long time, that in which the sort of cycles of production and and waste disposal and things took seven generations to work themselves out. In a way, that's kind of what you yeah. kind of what you want. That is in ways in which that intergeneration the, the the maintenance and management and governance of that intergenerationality becomes the the thing. Unfortunately, many of the ways in which we do have energy systems that do have waste that last seven generations yeah. are excluded from the conversation because they last seven generations. And that's, that's, a, that's, I think, a misrecognition of what, what the option is. Yeah. yeah, and also, I feel like financial markets don't have the conceptual tools to account for that, for those time scales. And whilst they're really good at connecting the material, for example, corn, uh, <laughs> how much corn we, you know, is grown this year to the price, and then next year we make less, more or less corn. So it's like this connection with materials and price and chemicals and price is excellent on the side of time, you don't have the mathematical or conceptual tools that match the time scales that they're dealing with. I totally agree. And so part of this question of the, that geoeconomics would have to be a reorganization of, the, that, of those temporalities. I also think that key, the point that you're making about the rewarding for, rewarding for taking risk rather than rewarding for mitigating risk is, is, uh, is sort of essential here. Yeah. The, we were talking about corn earlier in the trophic cascades of corn around this as well, about the, the relationship between what, in the United States, the Iowa caucus is first, and there's this huge, we have, the United States has this enormous problem of type two diabetes. And there's a direct, there's like a really direct relationship between this because Iowa is basically runs on, on corn subsidies, where farmers are paid to grow too much corn not to grow corn, all the rest of this stuff. And because they vote first in the election, no one will touch, no politician will, like in the right mind would touch the Iowa corn subsidies. Um, and so corn syrup is 500% is cheaper than it should be. And so it's easy to put in everything. And so um, everybody, we have this type 2 diabetes. Anyway, trophic cascades. <laughs> Yep. As, as I understand, the like, general idea about the reappropriation existing technologies and uh, uh, how it works with the, uh, I mean, we need, we definitely will need uh, faster computations. And it uh, reflects to the idea of the technological singularity. So this is why we need like more heat and stuff like that. Mm. How it works. I don't know this, that we need, I don't, I don't know that we need more computation. I, I, I'm not convinced that we need more computation. I, 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 what I'm arguing is we need to use the computation we have for something else. So it's not about increasing computation. It's about reappropriating and keeping it at the kind of level that is uh, that can keep the viable planetarity and viable system. That's for sure. 
and it has to also the energy sourcing of where go, what goes into this as well. But there probably isn't a way there isn't a way in which to actually there isn't a way to sort of remake these infrastructures that we need and to remake them in a way that isn't energy intensive. Uh, it's it's part of the it, it's just going to certainly be part of this question. It's like, but which energy we're using and where this energy comes from and how it works to where it doesn't end up being this snowballing kind of kind of problem is 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 a real is a real sort of thing if you're if you're expending, if you're putting enormous amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere in order to build the thing that will remove the same amount of CO2 exactly. from the atmosphere, you might as well just stay home. Um, and so part of this is quite, we'll just sort of do this. But again, just to be clear, I'm not arguing for more, that like the problem is we don't have enough computation. Uh, rather, that, again, that we're, it's being used for stupid things. So it's more about the post capitalism ideas than technological singularity. I don't. I'm, I'm not talking about technological singularity either. I don't know. I don't, why do you? Where do you? Where do you because, get this idea from? Like, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> because uh, uh, everyone wants faster computation. Like, who works in technology fields? Like, for example, yeah. you need faster Wi-Fi. You need like to connect to internet faster. You want oh, no, obviously, to... faster computation for me, of, of, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I'm I, no look, I'm not as, as a user, like, oh, I'm not arguing I'm not arguing I'm not arguing against faster computation. I'm not arguing against more energy efficient computation or even more, you know, the ability for there to be to produce more complex functions with the same amount of computation or this as well. It, it's it's not an argument against that per se. Uh, you know, streaming real time streaming 8K VR you know, YouTube great. <coughs> You know, bring it, bring it on. It, the problem is that it's, it's going to be cats running into plate glass windows and other sorts of things. Again, again, it's it's not the problem. Isn't the more or less the problem is that w what we're using it for is something that is um, self undermining and uh, essentially yeah. pathological. So it's a re it is a repurposing of not only the technology itself, but what the technology is being, the functions of the technology, whether or not it's more or less or faster or slower. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not the it's not the central issue for what we're talking about here. If you want to introduce it as an issue, that the speed will actually is necessary in some sort yeah, of way. I, 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 I it's, you can do so, but just to make sure that's I'm, that's not what I'm saying. Here. Requires uh, faster computation and storage of more data. This is why I'm asking. Mm, it may be. Because, I mean, if Mark was here uh, from the previous program, he could tell you a story about his company that he built in. New Zealand actually works in a different way, so the data storage for this as well. Part of the shift in large scale, one of the shifts you're seeing in large scale data architectures is it, it's, um, we tend to think about where you've got the, mach the computation is expensive, the data is cheap, and so you've got this big expensive machine that you pay several thousands of dollars for, but the, da the data, and you get a new machine, you move the old data onto the new machine because data is cheap and you move it around. But as you're dealing with very, very, very large amounts of data, just the physics of moving that much data from one place to another can be, include from the energy cost to the error correction cost, can be prohibitive. Whereas compu as computation gets faster and cheaper, it, it, the computation is getting cheaper. So you're beginning to see a kind of flip in the architecture here where you have huge amounts of data that stay put and the computation becomes virtual and goes across the network to where it needs to do things in one way or another and report back on what it, on what it found. And so this flip of the, from one into the other is, is kind of interesting. So I, again, is, I think it has, it, they're, part of the appropriation may involve some of these forms of rearrangements uh, that would have to do rather than just a simple turning of the knob of moreness, um, pun intended. So do we have to make a choice to either cat videos or computation? Yes. No, no, you can have cat videos. And after the revolution, you can still have cat videos. So. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. The final cat video. <laughs> that's the that's the real purpose of the Hegelian Google, as it turns out. <laughs> you may have cat videos. Yes. Again, I'm serious. I don't mean. To, I'm not. Are you, you're joking about this. If there's a sense to where like somehow this is an argument against uh, whimsy or like no fun allowed, then it's not going to work. 
So after all the things that we discussed today, like all, and yesterday, and all the complexity of the situation, the accidental megastructure, the uh, cascades, uh, no one holding the keys from the engine, which is uh, like moving everyone around in all the weird situations. It just seems like the still the idea of planning applied to it, it's so much like not fitting in. Like how can we really plan in this condition of the complexity? It seems like it like might be more about the plot, like something more underground, something like hijacking the system or the idea of the like attunement and the disposition and the you know, all the know how idea of the medium design, something like that, like more uh, getting the leverage points and acting upon them, but how can we really like apply this top-down general planning uh, possibility to it? Like it's still not completely matching together. Mm. Well, I think what we we'll want to take, a, you, you, it's not one or the other, you sort of to do both. And, and also there's a qu the difference between what we as, we together in this program here at Stroke are going to be able to do. Uh, versus the the essentially something like the policy models that are we can directly propose or can be uh, communicated or prototyped by the work that will be done by others, different thing. But I think one of the ways in which I think that part of that question may be uh, ways in which it might be addressed, if not sort of answered, has to do with looking at the ways in which planned economies and planned ecologies are all, are all around us. And all sort of exist, and so one of the people. That's that the point that they're not working. So they work. Amazon works. It's just optimized for the wrong thing. Uh, Samsung is a planned economy in terms of searches, and it works. It's just largely optimized for some of the sort of the wrong things. And so what will be? I think understanding how those planned economies actually work, and understanding how they what their reversioning of them might be towards you doing something else would be. Is, is, is the exercise that would need to sort of to go through to get this. So one of the guest lectures will have, I mean, a few people talking about this, one of which is a guy named Lee Phillips who recently wrote a book on, called The People's Republic of Walmart, uh, in which he argues for that uh, Walmart is 75% the way towards a planned socialist economy. We just need to sort of get it in a, sort of, in a, in a, in a different sort of way itself. Um, there's, a, another, there's a passage in the later parts of the stack in which I talk about um, uh, another thing. If, I'm saying, if you haven't read the book Red Plenty by Francis Spoofert, it's a historical novel that takes place in the 60s and 70s about the Soviet computer scientists and cyberneticians who were responsible for calculating the prices of the various planned economies and the kind of the scrounging for computational resources that they had to go through in order to sort of do this, ending up calculating the whole price tables for 11 time zones using calculative capacity of, you know, of my watch um, to, to, to do this. And, and it's done as a historical sort of novel. But what's really clear from the become sort of through this, and this was a, something that Phillips talks about in this book, and. Nick Cernicek talks about this in his platform, Capitalism Book, and another, who will also be talking about the planned economy aspect of this as well, um, is that the current platforms, the, the genealogy of the platforms that we have, um, it equally comes from those, those socialist planned economies of, the, of that era as it does from the supposedly autocatalytic, autopoetic emergence of the certain versions of, of the way in which the Silicon Valley has been interpreted and misinterpreted. It's actually part of why I think Fred Turner's, for example, his history of Silicon Valley is actually kind of misses all of the sort of the points. He's emphasizing this sort of elective libertarian sort of self-assembly sort of logic of the two where it's qu quite clear and really nobody argues the fact that, that these mega systems have a, are operating in this sort of planned economy sort of sort of way. So in the book I talk, in the sort of book I sort of see sort of a thought experiment, is like you took one of those guys from Spoofert's novel, the cyberneticians from the 60s, and, I said, and you said like, okay, look, in the future there'll be this thing, and um, what this thing does is it prevents, it, it presents everything that uh, anybody could, would, might want to, to, to buy, 
but it doesn't actually make anything. And it uses computers to calculate in real time a price signal based upon the the sort of artificial supply and sort of demand model. And then it's this, this big national lo logistics infrastructure and delivery system and it warehouses stuff in between. But it doesn't actually make anything. It's just pure mediation between these buyers and sellers. And for most of the time, it won't actually make a profit either. This was sort of, and, and they would sort of nod like, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's what we mean. And that's, that's Amazon. Um, and so, Again, I think to this question of those, what the sort of planned, what the, 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 the idea of a planned economy seems totally alien. Um, I think it's because we've tricked ourselves into thinking that uh, what we live in is something else. And also, I think that the comparison between something that is highly integrated and then something that is not, because if I'm not mistaken, the book, they're making the which book? The People's Republic of Walmart. Mm -hmm. Like they're making this case of also this kind of planned economy, centralized uh, corporation also being more successful because there's no internal co competition between like directors or I mean like this kind of free will, free market kind of uh, atmosphere which kind well, of makes it work as well. Also that, yeah, yeah, but it's also like this kind of uh, mm -hmm. like kind of culture, like cultural company as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, well, there's a certain degree of, yeah, there's a degree of commandability yeah. that they are internal sort of command. I mean, there is, there is forms of competition within this in certain sorts of ways. I mean, for example, I mean, the ways in which Amazon will sort of do this, it's kind of sort of cutthroat where they'll be, their workers like, okay, we want to begin to, begin to do this is now, they'll put three teams on the project and, you know, they're all working against each other and two of them lose uh, in order to sort of make this work. But to this point, it's like, as opposed to you walk into any American super, you know, American supermarket and there's an entire aisle of 57 different kinds of laundry detergent, all made by two companies. Um, this is this is extraordinary um, uh, market irrationality uh, around this kind of thing as well. So this in, this the intensification of the duplication, the duplication of, of 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 products and services because there is this competition. I think is sort of some of this sort of the point around here as well. One soap is not enough. You got to have like some. You got to keep keep people on their toes a little bit. Five, five soaps. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, but I was also thinking on this uh, plan, uh, like this relationship between the plan and economy and like this feeling of not being able to see right now how to plan with all this complexity. Would, would that like be where the sur surveillance then comes? Like with this data gathering? possibility of network? To an extent. I mean, part of the, re I mean, part of Philip's argument and also what, you know, it's uh, that I had sort of made earlier around Amazon is the ways in which they're able to produce, they're able to function in this way is their ability to, they have enough data and enough of a structure at a large scale that they're able to calculate a, an artificial price. And so I talked about this and, and Spoofer sort of brings this up in relationship to what, you probably have sort of talked about this a few different ways, but in times, but in relationship to what the Austrian school economist Friedrich Hayek had called the socialist pricing problem. That if you have, that a socialist, his argument is in the 60s, is so, is even, even earlier, but we're talking about this in the application relationship to the 60s. But the, the argument is that a, social, a socialist planned economy will never be able to figure out what the proper price will something for be. The bananas will always be either too cheap or too expensive, and they'll show up at the wrong place at the wrong time because there's no way in which it can actually sense and model and gather the necessary information fast enough and calculate it and push it back out um, in a way that's actually fast enough. And one of the things that markets are, so says Hayek, is a pricing machine, that they are a kind of automat in the, in the whole aggregation of all the supply and all the demand, that they are a kind of pricing, that they are a pricing mechanism and a price optimization mechanism. And as we sort of talked about is that in a, perhaps in a weird way, things like Amazon and Walmart 
and the, the, so the Red Plenty, the Red Plenty Soviet cyberneticians were trying to were making the argument at this time, and this was a bit of an argument, and all the stuff about cyber sin in, in Allende and Stafford Beer and all the rest of this was, it was like, but if our computers were just fast enough, and if we had enough data, we actually could calculate the price fast enough if you can communicate it back and forth. And if we have the, if you have the sensing calculation and version that was big enough and fast enough that it actually could, you could have synthetic price signals. It could work. That's how the so we, the socialist economy, socialist pricing, we can actually sort of solve it. And the weird thing, perhaps weird, is that um, the socialist pricing problem has more or less been solved by Walmart uh, and Amazon. That they are the, they ended up being the proper grandchildren of um, those att those attempts at that sort of point in time. Again, no, this is not part of the Fred Turner story about uh, Silicon Valley, but th this would go to this kinds of this sort of question as well. Well, you could call it surveillance, but the fact that in a way that you know Walmart knows more about <laughs> no, Walmart knows more about their suppliers' businesses than their suppliers know about their business, so they can know they know exactly what to ask them, what to pay them, plus one penny, because they actually know what it, they actually know uh, more about this as well, and so you can call this aggregation and rationalization of data that, that, that is predicated on forms of surveillance. But that's really only part of the story. Uh, it's also then the way in which it, it organizes and, as I say, rationalizes this information in such a way that gives it a, the ability to set a price, the ability to organize the system, and to do so in a ways that is more effective than its competitors. Oh. But it would include, it has to include the, you know, the ability to input this information in a way that's reliable. So surveillance would have to be part of the story, but not, it's, it's not enough. Hey, um, I'd like to clarify. Uh, so you say that the urbanism we need is anti-anti-Leviathan. Doesn't it leave us with the fact that uh, a state or an authoritarian state can control and misuse the planetary scale computation? What exactly is anti-anti-Leviathan urbanism? Well, it's not sort of unequivocally pro-state. I assume this as well. I think that it really has to do with it, such as the, is that what some of the discussion we were having yesterday is that in the sense that we, in many ways, we, we have the technical means and logistical means and, and, and even conceptual means to a certain extent to deal with some of these issues. What, we're la what we don't have is this, these mechanisms of what we talked about it in terms of sovereignty, but the mechanisms of force to actually decide that this is, in fact, what's going to happen and to enforce it in one way or another, which is an, an issue of, of, of governance with a small g. And the shift in governance away from the, 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 the the observation and amplification of the sort of intentional general will of people towards the governance of directly of those the 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 the, the material reality of the planetary geochemistry that we need to need to transform um, is the shift in governance that we sort of need. But it's in words like that it said is that the last the terraforming that we have had the last 200 years that the Anthropocene as a terraforming project was one that was sort of governless, it was ungoverned and aimless, a sort of spontaneous, quite in a way sort of bottom up and unorganized kind of process. And that, again, what is, what you know, the alternative to this in a certain sense would be something that would be more deliberate, more artificial, more constructed. And that would take a certain degree of enforcement um, uh, it, it, in this sense as well. And so, it's not saying you know, it's not a arguing for wholesale state capture. It's arguing against the idea that the way forward is to is to evade and resist all forms of enforcement and governance in and of itself as both means and ends. So it's against that idea, not for all forms of state. Can I? Uh, can Also related to what you were saying, and also related to, into the concept of like bottom-up decision making and the spontaneous uh, talking. Also, in uh, I think there are conflict, conf, conflicting interests uh, on different visions of progress and like also parallel decision decision making systems. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'm thinking. Um, they're building a huge dam in Ethiopia because they need electricity because they want to maybe work on technology and uh, um, 
uh, expand their computational uh, capacity. And this is going to have huge consequences also like on uh, neighboring countries, on the Nile, on uh, mm -hmm. the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the decision-making process that this is being made and the geo geoengineering mm, project that is being made uh, doesn't take into account, like the decision that it is being taken um, is not shared like uh, on a planetary scale. So, uh, and also equally important, the benefits of it are not so yeah. equally shared, which, is, which are not the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? Having a democratic egalitarian process of decision making about something that would have may have a democratic and egalitarian outcomes, the one does not guarantee the other. Yeah, and all, yeah, and also, for example, like uh, as well, like immediately in two years they built the expansion of the Suez Canal, which already is uh, like changing the mar marine ecosystems and uh, bringing a lot of different. Uh, toxic uh, and infesting species from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. and also, this was like not taken into account and like thought yep. about it like for, for trade. So I'm um, yep. just talking about like. So I think these are example. These are kind of exemplary of, of these. The the these are exemplary of kinds of the the, the kinds of things we need to yeah, exactly. avoid. Like uh, and I just sort of actually understand you know how to properly model and construct. Again, it's not an argument for more infrastructure, more better. No, that no. isn't the same thing. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, um, I think I, I yeah. got this as okay. well, but like also that there are all these different uh, processes that are happening, and like also in a way uh, obscure agents and institutions that take decisions and we don't even know, and they're sovereign in a way, and they're acting, uh, and they have form of authority, and it's not even well known what effect they're having and what and when this. Yeah, I'm just like. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand your point. Um, so two things, just to sort of, I, I think you're, I totally, we're, I think we're on the same page here as well. Two things to sort of complicate this a little bit might might be, you mentioned you mentioned Africa as a sort of the site, Ethiopia and Egypt as sort of the site of those things are sort of going on. Um, I know about the Ethiopian dam. I think it's even worse. The, the implication was even worse than you, than you, than you described uh, here as here as well. Um, but I want to connect this to the question that he raised earlier about wealth redistribution. Yeah. If we're sort of thinking about what this, the next hundred years of this structure should sort of to look, what would sort of to look like, um, you know, the majority of people live in what sort of colloquially, you know, other than this, you know, th there's a you know, huge amount of people, including in the sort of area around the Asian Triangle that are in forms that were colloquially understood as the global south, um, who, in some, in, who many times have very different ideas about why, what forms of development need to be arrested and stopped than people in the global north have to do with this as well. There's, to your point, like if there was a more democratic voice for those in this sort of area, that they cl the implication they would clearly want this not to happen. Uh, don't be so sure uh, that this is necessarily necessarily the case. Part of the wealth redistribution issue also means a shift in the mechanisms for the production of of wealth to places in which who haven't who haven't benefited from who haven't had that in a way or another. So part of the idea that it's sort of more comfortable to presume in our cocoons in the global north that we can that they are quite comfortable where this sort of form, and clearly like that the, that um, these issues of sort of arresting modernity is, is something that that would be um, uh, 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 clearly the sort of the position that should, be, that should take is is um, uh, oftentimes you know met with a different splashes of cold water of reality. Um, the other thing I want to ask you though is again just from getting our thinking around the delinking of the means and ends thing here as well, is um, so the Ethiopian dam was sort of an example of which you have bo you got both bads. You got both. There is this sort of uh, this no, uh, non-democratic means by which this decision is sort of made, and it's something that would have this non-egalitarian and dest destructive, non-egalitarian and non-democratic means, and destructive and non-egalitarian and non-democratic ends. If there was a counter hypothetical, the counter hypothetical in which there was a different project, Project X, 
but the same scale and kind of structure. And it was one that was instantiated by a sovereign agents that were equally opaque, non-democratic, um, disinterested in the, in the local voice and, and opinion. But its outcomes would be ones that would be democratic, egalitarian, productive, and generally admired by the people that sort of live there. Would you allow for this? And also, where does the means ends economy? I go. I'm trying, obviously, trying to sort of point it sort of in there as well. I think. I mean, I'm sort of tilting towards a, trying to tilt you toward a little bit more of the, perhaps, pragmatic presumption that the, that the we our focus should be on the, on the ends. And that the, perhaps is the, the luxury of a preoccupation with means uh, is something that we should be um, we should be careful about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, again, not presume that the areas of the world to which wealth would be redistributed that the, their default position is is uh, to put the brakes on. It's not the case. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that your answer there actually uh, brought something into the equation we've not necessarily talked about that much, which is about legitimacy. Like maybe in the last example, the legitimacy comes from the people looking at it and saying, "Oh, okay, that worked," um, because otherwise the legitimacy, like the legitimacy, is retroactive. Because, well, actually, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because because I think if, if the idea is that like the model now is the legitimacy comes before people vote for something. Right, so that's is my and point. And yes, and it was legitimate yeah. because we because we voted for it. Um, if the idea is that everything, but people like, people people are unreliable. Well, <laughs> people uh, like Coldplay. Well, so. I get that. I get that. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> but if, so if the idea is that like similarly the the geotechnological shift has preceded the geopolitical shift, and that's the way that it has to be. No, like not the like way that it has to be. Or sorry, the, we should allow for this possibility. In a way in which that we allow for the possibility and even make room from it. Not, I'm not saying that it is a necessity that that's the way it has to be. Okay. Or well, but at least that right now, if we have the means to, to for example, prevent climate change, but it's not happening. And one of the reasons is that geopolitics is in the way. So one way around that geopolitics, as it's currently as it's saying. currently configured, it, it's cool. not that it's in the way. It's that it's it's just incapable. Exactly. It's like trying to hammer something in with a screwdriver. It's just it's not yeah. it's not going to work. So if the idea is that the thing which might change it would be geotechnological shifts as a as a sort of yeah as a sort of tectonic shift that has the secondary reverberation of this geotechnical systems that we're predicated on. Something. Yeah, yeah. This is that that's the you know I, I'm offering. This is the hypothetical yeah. that I'm offering. So, you. So, exactly. So yeah. so that being the case, you what. What's kind of very functional or useful about that is you obviate a lot of the, the, the or you get around a lot of the roadblocks. Um, you don't need to convince Harvard law professors that this is a good idea because <coughs> the technology will, you know, the, the solution follows in the wake of the, the technology. But at the same time, you do potentially have a crisis of legitimacy if people don't like the solution in the end. Or, mm -hmm. if, or if indeed they just say, yep. I don't really care about whether it's a good solution like that, you know, like I just want to make my position. You know, do you know what I mean? Like I think that, that there might be a sort of what what now element where it's like, cool, we solved it. Like it, this actually works really well. And still you have billions of people complaining about it. Um, like I think that there might need to be some sort of It's 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 super it's not, it's it's more more likely than not some version of this. Like it, it, what? People like complaining. I mean, I think that that's let them. Let the, this is fine, and I, God bless them. This is yeah. the thing to do. This exactly. is sort of do. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to stop them. It's that just that can't. Fact. It's just that that can't be the. No, no, that's like the thing. Not to do it. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is that um, it's still it's a problem that traditionally you don't have to solve because you're able to say to people, well, you you voted for it. You know, this is what you get. This is the system. The system's legitimate. The issue that you have is this sort of like retroactive. Search for legitimacy because if you don't, yeah, I, I wonder though. I mean, you know, this this adage that we were talking about earlier: technology is is whatever has been invented since you were born. Everything else is sort of just just the world. 
most of the technical systems and infrastructural systems on which we depend and which we live all the time, no, we didn't vote for. We didn't, I, no one just, none of us decided that like that's where the city should go. It's a 1400 year old city. We've inherited these decisions all along down the line. And that, that's, that's kind of this process. We, we, we assume a certain ret sort of automatic legitimacy to it because we just assume it's like, well, you know, that's just kind of, that's where, that's where, the, that's where the city is. Yeah, uh, and we don't, there isn't a, you know, there hasn't been a strong loop to say, like, you know, Moscow's in the wrong place. Yeah. Move it to the. But what I'm saying is, like, that's, and that's a problem. That is a like, problem? That's, that's, not, that's not the solution, but at least built into it. People, I think, they like the narrative of everything before me is the world, and my life constitutes modernity and technology. And, you know, I think that, that that's yeah. something that's sort of understandable for people. Yep. It might be a bit harder to say, um, you're going to get that minus the legitimacy that you would have received from the narrative. Like, I, I think what I'm getting at is it's about this anti mythology. Sort of yeah, but but there's a difference. I, I I want to make this sort of. I, I think we're going this, and I think it's an. It ends up being. I think there's a sort of also a, a perhaps very interesting direct sort of pragmatic discussion sort of had around this, and not necessarily Machiavellian terms, but um, still whatever is there's a difference between the, the, the. I think your point. There's ways in which all of us have a feel a sense of legitimacy. Uh, the no, a kind of a, 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 that that that, just that may in fact be certainly not exactly the same thing as the fact the the outcome of the thing that we're talking about was actually produced by this this the that that voice that has this feeling of legitimacy in it itself and so I wonder the question the way another way to sort of ask the question in a different way is what would be the forms of legitimacy or sense of legitimacy around those type, the, the sorts of things, even if they appear through a different means. Uh, and, and that they appear through a different means other than this, in th this relaying of general will. Uh, that doesn't mean they cannot be legitimate or have legitimacy. And the I guess which, so what, but how so? I, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to yeah. be honest, I think that like, yeah. you basically stated the question which was in my mind, um, oh. other than the end bit of the question for me, which is without myths. Without, without what? Without myths. Without myths. Some, some sort of, and whether I'm misunderstanding really what you mean by myths, but I think maybe the response to storytelling, to narratives, to um, the ways that these things can create legitimacy sort of out of nothing. Um, you know, not out of anything material, not out of anything genuinely historical, not out of anything technological or, or mm -hmm. you know, nothing real. If the idea is that we want to proceed without creating any new myths, um, there might be a gap of legitimacy where, you know, the, and I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that you myths, but it, it just might be we need to think about something else. Yeah, I guess I would say, yes, I, the point is well taken. I wonder whether or not there's, a, there's what you're whether or not what you're talking about actually is properly described as a myth in this way. Some, 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 ways, some ways it might be, some ways it isn't. There's also then the kind of Straussian distinction between the necessary myths that a society needs in order to occupy, which are maybe held in a certain degree of bad faith. Right? The myths that everyone believes. There's myths that everyone follows, even if they don't believe in them. And there's myths that people follow without knowing that they believe in them. And so which kind we're, we're talking about here is, is, another, is, a sort of, is another kind of question this as well. Uh, I guess the simple point I'm making at the sort of the beginning of the book and including in this list is, is maybe it's sort of now past its usefulness, but we're specifically sort of talking about it is without the sort of the, with a presumption of a kind of of let's begin with this disenchantment and secularization of the myths that we don't that we are believing in we don't that we don't know that we believe in, and the ones that we don't we are acting as though we believe in them but we really don't. Let's just go ahead and set these aside and. Something else, and you know, but I, I think the point that you're making, I don't, I think, is uh, quite important. I don't well, and, and well taken. So, the, but that question of, of retroactive legitimacy or kind of structure here as well. I would just want to include a little bit, of just a, both a little bit more of this sort of Luciferian red trolley problem um, that I'm that I'm supposing here as well. Is like if I gave you a button, in which it would actually cause something to happen that would have this, the effects that 
that you're seeking, but it would do so in a way that in the short term, those that it would experience would, 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 uh, would, have, would, would have absolutely no sense of legitimacy in relation to his outcome. And whatever you imagine to be the absolute schism between good outcome and bad means, do you push, do you push the button? Um, or at what point does the, the means matter in this way, and why so? My job. <laughs> Much as we didn't vote for iPads, for example, we also didn't vote for these. Uh, we didn't. We didn't vote for most things. So, like the no, idea, the no, idea no, that no. Vo the votes is what causes the world is already kind of a. And weird. There's a okay. Okay. No, no. I, 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 I guess your point. No, your your point was quite well taken. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we didn't. Yeah, we also didn't vote for this emerging. Uh, shape of architecture today, which is the kind of human free automated zone of, you know, agriculture or um, server farms and so on. And I think that um, they, when we're first faced with these, so in the Young magazine and so on, you know, your kind of immediate knee jerk, uh, anti artificial response may be, well, this looks like a sort of denuded ecology. This is a uh, more kind of desecration and so on. But actually, kind of the the, the contra effect to that is that it has this effect of kind of it's a it's a kind of terraforming, and it alerts us to the fact that not doing this is also terraforming. And going back to Pierce's point earlier about sort of how do we give granularity to the types of surveillance we want, these spaces may in fact be extremely fertile grounds for thinking about deindividuation and how. Mm -hmm. uh, that might function and the kinds of things that we might hope to monitor. Um, yes. And I think I had a question, but I don't know. No, no, I, I agree with this. Also, I mean, there's lots of, I, 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 I think so in lots of ways. The Yeah, and I, think, I was thinking about. Rem has this image that he shows all of him of those, the automated interior farm that's this incredible violet purple because they figured out that like the onions grow better if you take out the blue from the spectrum. So it ends up looking, the place looking like this. Like if Oliver Eliasson had this at the, the Venice, we would be all applauding, but it's, it's just an onion farm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, went, I think I went, my head went back to this morning yeah. when we were talking about, um, like your example was wars as being a de-individuating crisis and that the climate we, we, and so in like response to Pierce? The of the Green New Deal. No, I was saying, I said, well, this was the first sort of like massive mobilization of a societal meta project in 100 years. And I was saying, sure. no. Which that, immediately made me think. That's what wars are. I mean, that's not, is not necessarily such a great thing. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah. No, nor is the climate emergency. And it's not having its desired effect where a war kind of does because of these issues of legitimacy and so on. But Possib that, possible. Um, but that, yeah, where we don't. Um, where we kind of, when we want to go up to the level of, of the planet, I think like using a human free space is perhaps one of the most profitable kind of uh, creative realms from which to kind of make that leap. Could be, yeah. yeah. I, think that's I think that's one of the reasons, I think that's in the spirit by which I'm trying to mm. sort of put these, on the, put these on the table as territorial models in one way or another, rather than just as a, a sort of uh, index of tactics, but that they, they, they there's it, the more interesting is their implications beyond what we sort of see here. So I, I agree with that. that this take. It's also interesting that this pattern of emergence is something that's not just occurring, say, in the, the North American stack or whatever. This is something that's being replicated and also, you know, but, but in, in an almost headless way, it comes with the, with the, the growth of the, the computational system, infrastructure rather. I can, yeah, and also this, you know, you don't the, some version of the Wilson half Earth thesis. There's the aspect of it of sort of setting aside this sort of artificial, uh, you know, the artificial territory that is this massive, you know, this the continent scale exclusion zone. But the other side of this is the of the implication of this is an increased intensification of the uh, of the what receives the technologization of the of the urban systems that humans do have, right? There's a sort of intensification of amalgamation on one side of the fence 
so, so that there is the exclusion on the other side of the fence and vice versa. There's a ways in which they kind of presuppose mm -hmm. one another. And that's another way in which these, some of, and other parts of these kinds of architectures are instructive is that, is the ways in which that some of the logics of the, of the factory mm -hmm. sort of, the, in the, that are both sort of, both, where you see both this amalgamation and the exclusion in, in, as part of the program of the space, uh, begin to escape and seep into the city itself. Mm. Uh, and to begin to sort of suggest other kinds of models for this cohabitation with other forms of other mm. both of these forms at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting that this territorial zoning logic seems to emerge almost uh, without a kind of will. You know, this is why the, the geopolitical system as it stands has no real problem with this happening, but it is a it's also not really cognizant of it. To your point, it's not. Exactly. It's not as exactly. though. It's not as though like there was a. There w it wasn't. Someone just not, not. We didn't vote for it. There was no. There was no law passed. There was no nothing. It's. It's not. It's not a policy in many sort of respects. It's kind of a, a function of, of landscape. You know, efficiencies of landscape use and trying to intensify the amount of growth that you can do per acre and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So the implications for planability, though, does, in this is the what you're suggesting is that suggests the uh, that because these seem to appear without a plan, that the planability of this strategy is not something that we should presume. Or were you implying something no, else? No, it's more. Um, I just. I'm not sure. Well, it's, it's surveillance that got me here, basically, when we were having that kind of conversation. And it then went back to, like, where is surveillance happening that we're totally OK with in a zone where there are no humans? Um, and so if we're kind of slightly on team surveillance here, this is a worthwhile uh, architecture to, to highlight. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yes. it's, it, it's planned, but it's planned in a pretty good way. Yeah. I assume when we heard about the Volkswagen, Emissions hack. We were, we were all team surveillance. We were all team surveillance then. That might be more of the founding myth than the phenomenon. Yeah, certainly. I want to go back to that red button. That you push every, everything gets fixed, but then everything is weird. And yeah. So just what I meant was like there's some red button where where the ends would be maximally good. And the means, but the means would be maximally bad. I mean, I think whatever I think, that means for you. But I think that poses uh, another problem for a terraforming because maybe the terraforming project is not only about an environmental adaptation. Maybe it's also about a creation of a socio-economical uh, structure through which the humans can live. I, like that slide not, with not the maybe. 120 trillion. Yeah, yeah. Not maybe. It game. absolutely is. Like yeah. Th that's a. It's, it is a terraforming project of a social reality that we live in yep. that is going in a direction that we don't want it to go. Uh, yes, they're both. They're, 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 I, I'm trying to. I've been trying to. I hope I've been. It's been clear that I'm trying to say in forty-seven different ways that these are these are in fact inextricable from one another. And so, so if it, what you're suggesting is so, these, I mean, sunset, in yeah. some sense, when you press that red button, nothing changes. I mean, yes, it's less hot, but you have. Uh, so let, yes, the, we don't have climate change going down the drain, but nothing has been changed. Maybe I don't. I mean, there, I, I I meant I guess I the thought we don't we don't have to sort of hold on thoughts for longer than it needs to, but rather, uh, if the worst possible means that you can think of is that <laughs> nothing changes, uh, I think you should. Try harder on that. I mean, no, I, what I, I'm I wasn't to say really is that the, the we're still in a right. crisis. What? By nothing change, I mean, it's still a crisis condition. It just it, yeah. If what you're suggesting crisis. is like simply carbon remediation and sort of removal of the carbon molecules in and of itself, if nothing else changes, that this will, that this isn't sufficient. And this this is this is uh, not really solving the problem because it will, it's 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 sort of not understanding the scope of the, the scope of actually what the the scope of the problem that has been defined, that has been developed by this this historical terraforming of the last two hundred years. The historical I, terraforming I, I, is not, I a, is not something that impacts all of us. Like, of course, it, it does. It, 
but it's not in the same way. No, not there in the same way. But there are groups, and there are certain uh, there are groups that have uh, are more vulnerable to those of issues. Of course. And there are groups who will be very little affected within current generation, maybe two, three generations. Uh, uh, yes. Affected in different ways, but yes, of course. So it's I, I see it as a part of absolutely. No, no, absolutely. I, my my question is more. Um, my question is not it not it not to push back on what you're suggesting at all, but rather, um, I'm a little bit curious as to whether or not you th think that what you're saying is in contradistinction with what I'm saying. Because if, if it is, I don't think that it is. No, no, I, I think no, it's, no. Um, it's it's not in a in contradiction. I think it's sort oh. of bringing some of the ideas about red, that red button that oh. we think can solve the, um, our climate crisis. And yeah, yeah, understanding yeah. that <laughs> part of climate okay. crisis is that certain entities are understanding that we have a climate crisis, have known about the climate crisis much longer than some of the scientific bodies, and sort of making choices to continue. People working, um, <coughs> like we have actively, we actively make decisions that uh, affect negatively the project of mitigation of climate change. Mm -hmm. And those decisions are still being made, and certain certain entities gain advantage of this. Yep. And it's part of the problem is that gain of advantage. Those are not two separate issues. I agree. Yes. Can I just add quickly yeah. to his point? Because yeah. I think I think maybe in addition to geoeconomics, geopolitics, geotechnology, we also need geoethics. And we will need to develop a new kind of system of ethics for the new geotechnology, geopolitics, and et cetera. Just, well, so, just to ensure that we do not stay with the same kind of oppression, marginalization, and whatsoever, um, we'll mitigate, we'll mitigate the climate change, but you know, we still have the same hierarchies of power. Perhaps I, I, I'm I wouldn't not necessarily against it. I I guess I would. I'm I'm not convinced that the reason that we have this, these pathologies within these certain structures of power is because of a, because people have been unethical, that there's a, that there's a problem of that this is the end end results of a, misethic et, myth mis ethicizing of our of our process. Do you believe so? Do you think that we have that things are as they are because we've been we, we we've been bad? Oh yeah? Okay. <laughs> well that's a much easier problem to solve, <laughs> actually. <laughs> You're saying it's a problem of incentives, that it's not the bad people who did the bad thing, but that they were incentivized to do something which was bad, but that's the real cause of I mean, the, the geoeconomics being skewed. No, neither one, actually. No. I mean, then how, how can we explain the US withdrawal from the climate program? And what ideology that is not. Uh, I don't think anything to do with ethics. Saying, Let's not ethics, oh, oh. but it's a very particular way of thinking of saying, no, that climate thing is your problem. We're not dealing with it. This is one of this is one of the uh, this is a, a way to characterize this decision for sure. I I don't think that's why this decision was being made. It goes deeper than this. I'm sorry. I'm kind of exhausted at the end of the six hours. Well, I may have I may have said everything I. I have already said everything I think, uh, and, I, and I'm not sure that I can actually probably give you another answer other than I don't necessarily disagree with what you're suggesting. To, to me, it's good that having the wrong engine because of a because a camera is not a problem of ethics. What is it? What is it a problem? Say this again. Having having the wrong engine because a camera being the financial system as opposed to some other system that would have to would create the, the proper technology. I'm sorry, I'm not following. Like where does the, <laughs> where do engines come from? The financial system being an engine because of camera. 
Because the camera, yeah. If we had uh, it, having the the one that we have being obviously not the one that we need, so having the wrong engine because a camera is a problem not of ethics, but a problem of what? I I I don't know. I feel like I've I've sort of ex yeah. explained this in extraordinary detail over the last sort of few days. I'm a little bit befuddled, but but like, isn't that what I've just been saying for for like 14 hours? It's like where does the tension come from? Yes, no, I oh, oh, oh. It's not, I, yeah. I'm not uh, still wondering if it's an ethical oh. problem. I'm just wondering, like, how would we, if it's not an economical problem, if it's not a, we can talk about it tomorrow. Probably a good idea. I, I think Kiara's idea around the sort of the reward of risk versus the reward of the mitigation of risk is one of the ways in which the part of the, is, is a, probably a good idea on some of these kinds of actions around this world. But there's lots of them, which I've, I've sort of mentioned in considerable detail. But. Maybe we can pick this up tomorrow when I yep. do you want to start question. with it. It's a reductive comment, so hopefully it's uh, not as Less complicated. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, felt, I felt like obviously we're getting more and more complex as we try to grasp the larger sense of the whole picture of what we're trying to work on. Um, and perhaps in some senses, maybe sometimes losing a bit of sight of like, so what is the role of our design project? And I wonder if this reduction potentially to your sense, gets slightly close to it. But I feel like a lot of what you're mentioning, like for example, plant economies exist in the form of Walmart. Uh, the engine or the, the, the read-write system exists in the form of the financial system. There are examples of the system and the models we want, just not in the way we want them. So is it a sort of a sense of like the elements are there, the solutions are there, the examples are there, and the designer's task is sort of sort of recombine, reframe, recontextualize these elements to suggest a, a new, but rather a sort of repackaged plan that can then be fought for, um, which gets us out of the current shadow play of sort of political Iran. Um, sure, lots of other things, lots of other things beside that, uh, but that was, that's a that you go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of other things besides if we go with that, yeah. I guess the issue, the thing with the ethics, I was sort of, sort of blanching on it here, sort of as well, is I'm trying to make the argument over the sort of few days is that the presumption that the way in which that each of us sort of experiences our experience of the world and organizes our choices in relationship to this, and an understanding of the world as itself, the accumulation of all of these individual acts of volition is exactly how we got here in the first place. Yeah. It's exactly why we're in this, this it's, 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 it is a form, it, it's one of the ways in which our, our, our forms of, uh, of anthropomorphic projection of our, ourselves onto things. The way, the, like, the, it rained because, the weather's weird because we've been bad, <laughs> is kind of like, is is more the problem than the solution in the ways of thinking, and so I, I yeah so I guess this is why the, it's it, I'm not I'm not arguing for people doing bad things I'm I'm basically arguing is like I I'm not gonna I, I would be hesitate to put a lot of weight into the question of sort of retraining people retraining people to it also sort of comes back a little bit to what she was saying about like the, this is a problem of the individual the reason this is because like you've been doing the wrong thing with your trash. Uh, and like you're, you're not taking the bus enough, and this and this this pushing of all this sort of clearly a systemic problem to the edges, in such a way that it turns this clearly a deeply systemic historical problem that goes back multiple generations into a sort of an accumulation of uh, the accumulation of, of either variously good or bad uh, moral gestures in the present it seems to be a fantastic misrecognition of really what's going on. No, it's not necessarily saying what that's what you're saying, but. Uh, Okay. The structural and systemic issue itself, in which um, climate change in itself becomes an example of structural violence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. instead of kind of thinking of an environmental risk case, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not, you can still put a fear in those things. So of course. Very real, very real. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, okay. 
let's keep let's keep talking about it. So that, that's that's sort of helpful. In this sort of role. Yeah, I mean, I think if the term, if the way in which you're introducing the notion of ethics has to do with the kind of that this will inevitably involve a, a sort of a change in the way in which we uh, in which we understand the way these op these operations sort of work, and that there's different sort of ways in which the things are variously validated and invalidated within this. Just like what what is going on and where is it? Going? Maybe a little bit to do see what we were talking about about the multi generational ways of thinking about what the concepts of what these sort of things are. When are we and where are we and in what in what sort of scale and scope of their actions being taken place in, by which we are modeling our own place within the representation of this system? Maybe there's a way in which the, what you're calling ethics is kind of like how it is that we think about what we're doing within the context of the doing. So that we would decide, be able to sort of redecide those decisions in such a way that the doing that we're doing is actually sort of more works, and like, and that there's a degree of like we've mismodeled our sense of our own actions within the system in such a way, and that this mismodeling is is quite rosa, I think, for sure. Yeah, I think the language of ethics is something I'm, I'm choking on, but that might that's maybe not it. We can. Just, that's fine. We'll figure something else out. But if that's the sense that you mean it, then yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah.